Welcome to the Long COVID Coalition. My name is Joachim Gerlach and I'm Head of Product Development at Vedesens Biotech. Together with Dr. Valentina Viduto from the Long COVID Foundation and Dr. Philip McMillan from Bayern Health, we are bringing the leading global experts on Long COVID to the table in order to get a deeper understanding of the various multi-systemic conditions at play. Hi, my name is Dr. Paul Merrick. I'm a critical care doctor. I've been practicing critical care for over 35 years now. My interest in COVID started in March of 2020 when we were faced with this pandemic important to solving these very important issues. And so thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Valentina Viduto, and I am a founder of the Long COVID-19 Foundation. And I'm really looking forward to our speakers to help you understand the main challenges we have in that field. Thank you. Hi, I'm Martin. I'm postdoctoral research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light in Erlangen. Take the opportunity, like to take the opportunity to uh, present. Hello, my name is Dr. Mark Fabrowski. I'm a British doctor in general practice who usually works in accident and emergency medicine. I look forward to being part of this third congress in thrombosis and coagulation. Thank you for having me. My name is Abdul Manan Beg. I'm from Pakistan. I'm a lead researcher on uh, uh, emerging infectious diseases in COVID and long COVID. Uh, it's a pleasure to join them. Hello, my name is Anja Baranova. I'm a professor in the School of Systems Biology in George Mason University, Virginia. And I am interested in the systems pathogenesis of long COVID. I am working mostly in the area of human genetics, and I'm really looking forward into uh, contributing to this panel. My name is Dr. Dobry Kiprov. I'm the founder and chief medical officer uh, officer of Global A Forensics thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Shankar Chetty from Port Edward, South Africa. I'm a frontline doctor and I've been examining uh, personally COVID patients from the start of the pandemic. And so uh, the understanding of the uh, long COVID process is vitally important in treating my patients. Hello and good evening, afternoon, morning to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this long COVID coalition conference on thrombosis and coagulation. So I'm Dr. McMillan and I'll be working mainly in the background today to coordinate everything as we've got an incredible lineup of speakers and panelists for you. And so without further ado, I will just add everyone in quickly and we will ask Quite quickly for uh, Dr. Valentina Veduto to share a few thoughts with us 
about the long COVID coalition. So Valentina, we'll just get you to say a few quick words before we get everyone to introduce themselves. Sure. Hello, everyone. Thank you for staying with us and watching the third Long COVID Coalition Coconuts. Long COVID Coalition is set to bring together scientists, doctors, advocacy groups and solution developers together for the purpose of helping millions of people worldwide suffering with Long COVID. And we started a series of bridge gaps in the knowledge and treatments. Today's focus is on on coagulation and thrombosis. So I really look forward to the finding top quality research that you will hear tonight. And I, I hope we can bridge some gaps in this domain. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just get everyone to quickly introduce themselves and we'll start with uh, Antje, if you could unmute your mic for us quickly. Hello. I am Anche Baran, I'm professor of the School of Systems Biology in George Mason University in the United States. I'm working with the pathogenesis of the complex human diseases from the point of view of systems biology, and I'm looking forward to contributing to this panel. Coagulation is very important, not just for post-COVID, but for the host of other illnesses in humans. And now we have a unique situation, a window into coagulation and new understanding of this process. Thank you very much. And uh, Paul, if you could just unmute. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for inviting me. My name is Dr. Paul Merrick. I'm a critical care physician and more recently the co-founder of the Frontline Critical Care uh, Alliance. Um, and thank you for inviting me. I look forward to today's conference. Thank you. And uh, Manan, if you just unmute. Hi, yes. uh, my name is Abdul Manan Beg. I'm a vocal advocate for patients with long COVID at uh, Twitter. I'm, my, mostly my work is on uh, neurotropic uh, intentions of this pathogen and uh, coagulopathies and thrombosis involving cerebral blood vessel. So it's a pleasure to join uh, the coalition today and the Congress. I, I thank to the invitees that they, they invited uh, for, to talk on this very important topic uh, on long COVID. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dobri, if you just unmute your mic. Yeah. My name is Dr. Dobri Kiprov. Mm -hmm. I'm medical director of Global Aphoresis. Uh, I was the first to describe the successful use of plasmapheresis in long COVID. Well, thank you very much. And Martin? Hi, everyone. My name is Martin. Uh, I'm postdoctoral research fellow here in Erlangen at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light. Um, I'm by training biologist and um, I started recently to look into COVID and long COVID um, from a physical perspective of the single red blood cells and other blood cells as I will introduce in my talk. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. And uh, Joachim? Hello, everybody. Yes, my name is Joachim Gerlach. I'm uh, head of product development at Medicinals, and uh, we are working on nutraceutical protocols to tackle COVID and long COVID conditions. And in the nature of our work is to go and look very broadband, uh, actually pretty um, opposite approach that, and then precision medicine. So as these natural molecules cover so much, so in our nature is to really look at all of these pathways and try to shine light into the ones especially that are not covered and how today's conference will bring more light into the coagulation conditions. Thank you so much. Thank you, George. And uh, Mark? Hi there, my name is Mark Fabrowski. I'm a British doctor in general practice. I also usually work in A&E. COVID put a pause on that. I'm a medical advisor for the Long COVID Foundation and also an expert panel member of the British Polio Fellowship. I've got a special interest in post-viral syndromes, having first-hand experience having long COVID and also as a carer of someone with post-polio syndrome. Thank you for having me on the panel. I'm here to advocate for patients, look for answers for questions and support healthcare professionals. Thank you, Mark. And Shankara? You're muted at the moment, Shankara. I am Dr. Shankara Chetty. I'm a private practitioner in South Africa. I've been treating COVID and long COVID from the start of the pandemic. Uh, thank you for having me as a panelist. It's important for me to understand the mechanisms at play to benefit my patients. Thank you for having me. 
Excellent. Thank you very much to uh, everyone. I will just very, very quickly um, just share the general sequence that we're going to have. Uh, this is an overall uh, picture where we'll have an introduction um, for uh, Dr. Paul Marek, who will then share some thoughts. Then we have presentation one, two, three, and potentially um, presentation four later on if we get Dr. Bieta to join us. So um, each presenter, except at the start, will be 10 minutes for Paul, and then after that, 20 minutes with question and answers. We'll do our best to try and manage questions as they come in. And so without further ado, we'll get uh, Dr. Valentina Vidu to, to do an introduction of Dr. Paul Marek before he has a quick chat about his um, perspective and experience. Thank you so much. So welcome to third long COVID coalition Congress on thrombosis and coagulation, where top medics, scientists from around the world will attempt to bridge gaps and share their views on causes of persisting symptoms of long COVID. So if you want to learn more, I would encourage you to watch this event from start till the end, and because we will help you to get answers relevant to your symptoms. And I would want to start today's Congress by introducing today's moderator and special guest, Dr. Paul Merrick. Dr. Merrick received his medical degree from University of Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, South Africa. He was an ICU attending at Baragwang Hospital, also in South Africa. And during this time, he obtained a Master of Medicine degree, Bachelor of Science degree in Pharmacology, Diploma in Anesthesia, as well as Diploma in Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Dr. Merrick did a Critical Care Fellowship in London, Ontario, Canada, during which time he was admitted as a fellow to the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Dr. Marek has worked in various teaching hospitals in the US since 1992. He is a board certified in internal medicine, critical care medicine, neurocritical care, and nutrition science. Until recently, Dr. Marek was a tenured professor of medicine. Dr. Merrick has written over 500 peer-reviewed journal articles, 80 book chapters, and authored four critical care books. He has been cited over 48,000 times in peer-reviewed publication and has an H index of 105. He has delivered over 350 lectures in international conferences and visiting professorships. He has received numerous teaching awards, including the National Teacher of the Year Award by the American College of Physicians in 2017. And recently, Dr. Merrick is the co-founder of the Frontline Critical Care Alliance, which is we all know called as FLCCC. So please welcome Dr. Merrick and I pass the stage to you. Well, thank you, Valentina, for that really kind introduction. And it's difficult to know where to start. So maybe I'll just start at the beginning and I'll keep my introduction reasonably short because we have an exciting program. So my involvement really started in March of 2020 when we were faced with an onslaught of COVID uh, in New York and the eastern shore of the United States. And if you can recall at that time, the NIH, the WH, the CDC basically said there's no specific treatment for COVID. The treatment was symptomatic, which was clearly absurd. We had a disease in which patients had a mortality in the ICU of up to 80%. And we were being told by the international and U.S. Uh, medical agencies that there was no specific treatment. Um, so when physicians are faced with patients that are suffering uh, and dying, it's absurd to do nothing. So that's why we put together our first protocol, um, the Math Plus protocol for the treatment of the hospitalized patient. But it soon became clear that um, what one really needed to do was treat these patients early to prevent them getting to hospital and deteriorating and indeed also preventing this disease. So for that reason, we developed protocols for both the prevention 
and probably what's the most important, the early treatment. And there's no question of doubt. There are multiple different protocols for early treatment, many different people across the world. But the unifying concept is that if we had treated these people early, we could have saved millions of lives. So we're now two, over two years uh, into this pandemic, and who thought we would have been where we are now? Uh, it's been truly an astonishing journey. We would have thought that we would have been able to control this by now. But it seems that COVID's not going away, and in its shadows lurk some very serious diseases. Firstly, there's the long COVID syndrome, which we're going to talk about today, which has really affected millions of P patients. You know, between 60 to 80 percent of patients who who develop COVID will have some lingering symptoms called the post-COVID syndrome. And then now we're suffering this worldwide pandemic of vaccine injured people uh, that um, suffer terribly debilitating disease. <laughs> so what's truly remarkable is the spike protein. There's probably nothing like it. And it does all kinds of really mischievous things um, that are truly astonishing. And it's a very complex disease. If you were to uh, do a literature search on COVID-19, you would, you would be retrieving four, over 4.9 million scientific papers. So this is in truly a very complicated disease. But we know the spike protein is a wicked protein. It does all kinds of things. By a number of pathways, it activates clotting. We more recently realized that there are epitomes that actually activate amyloid formation. We know that it results in the formation of multiple autoantibodies. And least but not last, and most importantly, we know that by a multiple mechanism, the spike protein activates clotting. And the clotting and coagulation cascade really is part of the complex pathophysiology of this disease. And you cannot really effectively treat an acute COVID, a long COVID, or a vaccine-injured patient without really dealing with these serious coagulation issues. And it is one of the more difficult issues to address and to treat so hopefully today's uh, conference will give some insight into the management of this important aspect of uh, COVID-19. And with that, thank you kindly. And I'm looking forward to some really good, exciting presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you for this introduction to today's discussion, uh, to today's topic. Um, as, a, as a founder of Long COVID Foundation and big advocate for those who suffer with Long COVID, I have a couple of questions to you regarding treatment protocols that, uh, that were in place for so long. And uh, we know FLCC has been a major source of early treatment protocols. And I think it still plays major role uh, in what we see today. But um, my question here would be with regards to reinfections of people with long COVID. So I want to specifically highlight this group of people because they already have massive damage and many have disability-like condition. So how does the current protocol address that for long hauler community? And what are the main strategies uh, to tackle reinfections uh, in those with long COVID? Yeah, so you ask an important question. So we know the spike protein is probably the most toxic protein we know. And what's important is the cumulative load of spike protein. So somebody who has long COVID and then gets another infection is just going to get another load of spike protein. Similarly, the worst thing that a long COVID patient can do is to get be vaccinated because then they're going to get an additional load of spike protein. So basically, if you, you have long COVID, apart from all the other you know, treatments we recognize, you have to do whatever you can to avoid getting COVID. But most importantly, and this is such a crucial point, 
if you have long COVID and you were to get COVID again, do not wait for testing. Do not wait for testing. You need to treat yourself absolutely critically early because the earlier you treat the patient, the more rapidly you're going to get rid of spike protein and you're going to attenuate the disease. The worst thing possible is to wait. So we know there are effective treatments for, for COVID. And if you are vaccine injured or you have long COVID and you get COVID again, you want to treat yourself early with a whole host of effective drugs because there seems to be a cumulative effect of ongoing damage with the more spike protein that you expose to. So that really is a good question. And obviously, the worst thing that a long COVID patient can do is to get vaccinated. That's just throwing oil into the fire. I mean, although people are still recommending it, it just makes no intuitive sense. So if you have long COVID, please do not get vaccinated. Thank you. And uh, if I may, uh, Joachim, I have another question uh, to raise. So uh, I completely agree with what you said with regards to spike protein. So from your, what would be your viewpoint on long-term consequences? What people with long COVID can expect in five years time if nothing is done today? Is that question to me or to Yakim? It's to you, if you may. <laughs> yeah, so you know, you ask a difficult question, which we, you know, we don't know. Um, you know, the long term follow up of the vaccines just don't exist. And, you know, the long term follow up of patients with, with long COVID, we don't know. One of the encouraging things about long COVID, as opposed to, you know, other chronic inflammatory diseases, is patients do tend to get better over time so so you know unlike the vaccine injured which who remain profoundly debilitated for months and years it seems that many patients with long COVID do get better with time so that, that is some you know something to be hopeful about um, what the long-term implications are you know we don't know but I think people who have long COVID need to do whatever they can to maintain their health. It's really important that they take matters in the hand. They need to enhance the immune system. They need to do all the right things to enhance the immunity. And again, as we said, avoid further exposure to the spike protein. So I think the outlook is reasonably good because I think many patients actually do get better with time. And as we'll hear, there are effective treatments for long COVID. So I think that, you know, it seems to be reasonably optimistic. But, you know, as you know, the future is impossible to predict. So, you know, we're going to have to wait and see. Yes, um, take, taking you up on that board, the, that the future is uh, impossible to predict. Um, there may be... a. Two points I would like to emphasize with you, especially as you are in the uh, frontline critical care of uh, of acute COVID, um, very active, and that it um, is a concerning also the long orders we had on the last conference. We had a, let's say new findings uh, on the bacteriophage behavior and that our gut bacteria is getting infected by SARS-CoV-2 directly. So that is um, an, a whole new game-changing um, uh, knowledge that we are. Um, have to also digest and include in the, into the acute treatment and into the treatment of the long haulers. And um, so also today we will have later on Dr. Shankar Chitty um, explain us a new finding he had in the course of last week uh, that is also bringing a complete new angle to uh, what is happening with the new variants and maybe people that got vaccinated or, or even our uh, recovered COVID-19 patients. So my question would be, we are, we are going to get a more and more mixed up picture. You will have people that had COVID, recovered, got reinfected, got vaccinated, got reinfected, long COVID, reinfected, vaccinated. So let's say a classification like at the beginning of the pandemic is almost impossible. Now, and adding that up to the complexity we see by the nature of the disease anyhow, um, do you have researchers in your organization that are 
um, not only medics, but that are really like looking at the research and evaluating and looking at the angles that are missing and that are not covered yet so that we can go further in the, in, and progress towards an all-encompassing treatment. Yes, I mean, you ask a good question. I think that you have to keep an open mind that this disease has many surprises that are going to take us down very unusual avenues. I mean, you quite correct the fact that SARS-CoV-2 acts a bacteriophage in your gut flora is truly an astonishing finding. And I think we're going to get, you know, we're going to find all kinds of unusual um, pathophysiological processes we, we never suspected. So I think one has to, I mean, you just need to look at the activation of amyloid, who would have thought, and prion proteins. So I think one has to keep an open mind. The It's truly astonishing what this, I mean, this little virus has 30 kilobases. It's one single strand of RNA. It seems to be much smarter, although it's a tiny little RNA, than most of the humans on this planet who have, you know, many, many chromosomes. So it's a very devious virus. It was exceedingly well designed. And I think it's going to lead us down some really unusual paths. So I think we need to keep an open mind as to what's possible and what can achieve. And obviously, you know, the, the concept of bacteriophages is, is truly astonishing. And, you know, we don't know where this is all going to lead. And... Um, we know that the spike protein does all kinds of really completely weird things. Um, so, um, you know, we just have to keep an open mind and it's very multidisciplinary. I think that's what's become clear is that, you know, to manage this disease, you have to be a clinician, a virologist, an immunologist, a pathologist, a pharmacologist, um, which is very difficult for a single person to do. So that's why I think it's so important that we collaborate together to bring all this knowledge together because it is, as far as I can see, this is the most complex disease that we've ever faced. And um, we really need to work together to try bring our different disciplines together to really try and help these patients who are suffering. The human suffering from this virus has been truly astonishing. And I think the best solution is that we scientifically come together it must be driven by good science by openness and that we work together and collaborate to achieve the best results for our patients thank you so much uh, i think that uh, we can leave it at this and go dive into the let's say the first part uh, of, of this uh, specific uh, looking at the uh, thrombotic uh, um, conditions and let's see later in the discussion what we can make out of this and, and also look at the long-term consequences that ben Valentina has already uh, mentioned a little bit that will be maybe a conference the next one or um, in, in six weeks or in, in that range will be a conference more on the long-term I, I call the post-long COVID um, conditions that you were mentioned prions um, amyloid plaque and neurological diseases that are not really yet documented but let's get into the conference right now. I'm looking forward. Thank you so all for your participation. It's a great Thank honor. You. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just ask you quickly to introduce um, Martin um, Paul. We'd appreciate that. Yeah, sure. So I do want to thank Valentino and Philip for putting this together and all their hard work. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Martin Crater, who studied biology and cell biology and genetics at the University of Leipzig from the Institute for medical microbiology and virology, often in internship at the German Cancer Research Center. In Haiti, he investigated transcription factors in acute myeloid leukemia development. He then moved to the Technical Insti University of Dresden, where he received his PhD in hemopoietic cell development in 2017, summa cum laude. During that time, he teamed up the, with a group of Joachim Guck to investigate the physical properties of hemopoietic stem cells during blood cell development and started his first postdoc, establishing real-time deformability cytometry for blood cell measure, measurements. After moving to the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light and the Max Planck Zentrum, 
for physics and medicine in Erlang. He was promoted to laboratory manager and leading researcher in microfluidic based blood cell diagnostics. His research centers on exploring the physical properties of blood cells and linking cell mechanical characteristics to the cell's probability to successful organ microcirculation. He has authored over 20 peer-reviewed publications and his work has been recognized by the Young Scientists Award of the German Society for Cell Biology in 2019 and the Medical Valley Award of the Bayerisches Stratenminister for Wachstrang Good Energy in 2020. Well, that sounds a really complicated bio. Obviously, Martin is a very well, has enormous expertise in this very focused area, and we do welcome him and uh, looking forward to his talk. So thank you, Martin. Yeah, thank you, Paul, for the introduction. That was that was great. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I have to say it's a bit unfortunate that some of these little pieces, they have no English translation and they are not allowed to uh, use English translation. And uh, therefore, I gave this in German. So thanks for the introduction. And uh, yeah, so I uh, basically could start my presentation. Yeah. Um, as said in the beginning, um, I'm going to present on the physical properties of cells and um, what we are doing here at the Institute and what my research focuses around is a feeling for blood cell function and uh, this in the context of COVID-19 and uh, beyond. And as this um, meeting here is on thrombosis and coagulation, which um, basically talks always about clots and reduced blood flow. I um, might want to introduce a new concept um, from, from our perspective, which centers on single cells and uh, their properties, their physical properties um, in, in, in reduced blood flow as well. Um, and therefore another level of something we have to think about. Um, with this, I just want to make a uh, Conflicts of interest statement, which is that I am co-founder and chair owner of a company selling deformability cytometry devices for blood cell analysis. Um, this is basically a research a research instrument. Okay, with this, um, I'm diving into the presentation. Um, I have a little outline, and I'm trying to introduce you to three different points. The first one, which I'm going to extend a bit uh, in order to make the concept clear, is what is physical phenotyping and why are we doing it? Uh, the second point is the physical phenotype of uh, blood cells in COVID and beyond. And if there is a little time, then we might also want to talk about some ongoing research and our current hypotheses. Okay, so what is physical phenotyping? Well, if you see this slide here, it shows obviously three uh, slices of an avocado. And you can clearly see that there are differences in this avocado, right? So this uh, might be delicious. This might be a bit too old already. Well, if you would close these avocados and you don't have the chance to look into um, the avocado, you do something else. You grab the avocado and you basically push on it in order to do a mechanical measurement. So you probe the mechanical features of the tissue in order to extract information um, about the internal situation. And this concept is very well known and it is used in a clinical um, uh, practice since thousands of years. Here I, we have an example where, for example, identifying tumor tissue in uh, the breast is done by palpation. And this concept is then also translated into um, multiple, uh, multiple disease detection. So to summarize this, palpation is one of the oldest diagnostic techniques using mechanical probes or mechanical probing. Um, and this mechanical probing reveals an information about the pathophysiology and uh, other processes behind it. And we, what we have done now is we um, wanted to use this concept not on tissue level but on single cell level and specifically in blood. Uh, in order to introduce you to this concept a bit more, we um, look here now at the development of blood cells. 
So at the bottom here, you see the um, fully differentiated mature blood cells um, from thrombocytes, uh, the different granulocytes, monocytes, or even lymphocytes here. And they all arise from a single stem cell, and this stem cell is called a hematopoietic stem cell. And in order to uh, form these different blood cell types, um, this cell divides and differentiates via multiple steps in between. And if you look here now on the precursor cell, this precursor cell is internally completely different than, for example, such a neutrophil here. On the left side you see, or in, in red, you see uh, the, the, um, the microtubules. And you see that these microtubules, uh, they are completely cross-linked, they are all over the place, while in the neutrophil, you have a clear polarized structure. So you see that the microtubules align along the cell's axis. And this can be measured by doing a simple mechanical measurement as we have seen it for the avocado. What we are doing here is, over a certain time, we apply a force on these two different cells and measure their deformability. So basically, their response to this force we apply. At one second time point, we apply the force and you see immediately both cells start to deform. But at a certain time frame, uh, let's say 1.5 seconds, the precursor cell behaves different than the neutrophil. So the neutrophil deforms much more over time compared to the precursor cell. When relieving the um, force, then all the, cell, the cell deformation decreases as well. And what implication has this? Well, just a very simple experiment can be seen here. We have here a precursor cell. And we have here a microfluidic channel, and this channel is smaller than the cell's diameter. And along this channel, there is a chemokine attracting the cell into this channel. And if I play the video, you can clearly see that the cell is not capable of entering this small channel. And we think this is because the cell is too stiff, so it's not deformable enough in order to perform this task. While if we look at the video of a neutrophil, where we have the clear polarity, for this guy, the entrance into the channel is super simple, right? It can deform, it goes into the channel and follows the gradient. So having said this, I can clearly state that probing the mechanical properties of a single cell gives you information about its functionality. This is not a new concept and we haven't invented this concept. This concept is around for yeah, 60 years now easily. And different techniques have been developed in order to assess the mechanical properties of cells. For example, we have here a micropipette aspiration where you have a very small pipette and you suck in a cell under constant uh, pressure and you can measure its deformation. Atomic force microscopy, very advanced technique where you have a cantilever on a microscope and you press with this cantilever on a cell and you indent into the cell and you measure the force which is needed to indent the cell. Another very advanced technique is the optical stretcher, which is again illustrated here. So you see the cells come, they get trapped by a light beam. Um, we can play this video again, exactly. Um, by a light beam and by increasing the light power, you see how the cell gets deformed along, the, the light, uh, along here, this x-axis. And all these developments have led to tons and tons of publication. I only uh, yeah, collected a, a, a very few of them. And also very old ones, I have to admit. Um, but this concept which was developed here and the proof of concept studies here have shown that, for example, um, tumor cells are softer than the surrounding tissue, or even that tumor cells with higher metastatic capacity have uh, higher deformability capacity. So they are also softer. 
uh, or, or more, even more softer than, than the initiator state. But until now, this te these techniques have not translated into clinical use. And why is this? This is because of the throughput. These current techniques, they measure at rates of 10 cells an hour up to 100 cells an hour, which is much too slow in order to probe the sheer amount of cells um, we have, for example, in our blood. Right? Even a microliter contains millions of cells. And if you want to assess a couple of them, you would need to apply long, long measurement periods. And this is where our research stepped in. We tried to change this. What have we done? We used the new microfluidic techniques, state-of-the-art techniques, in order to deform, measure and deform cells. What you can see here is, we have here a microfluidic chip where, red, uh, where blood cells flow from the left to the right, and these cells get centered into a measurement channel. How this looks in an overview is like so. This is the chip. The chip contains of two inlets. Um, the cells flow along this line here, along this axis, into this measurement region. And if I zoom into this measurement region, you can clearly see that the cell in the beginning um, is fairly round, while if I play the video and the cell enters the channel, you can clearly see how the, cells get, how the cell gets deformed due to the profile of the flow which is in the channel. And look here at the time frame. Yeah, so you see that the deformation from the entrance of the channel to the exit is only in a millisecond time range. So we measure here um, and we record videos here at um, rates of uh, 306,000 frames per second. Doing that and comparing it to the current techniques, so again, an optical stretcher compared to an RTDC measurement, reveals the difference. You see, again, in an optical stretcher, we have 100 cells an hour, and here we have 1,000 cells per second. And this translates to an increase of the speed by uh, 36,000 times, and therefore um, translates, therefore gives the capacity to translate this into a clinical application. And why is this important for thrombosis and coagulation? Well, just by a simple experiment I'm showing you here. This is a microfluidic channel which contains of successive constrictions, which are only five micron in diameter. So at the smallest points here, we have only a five micron, we have only five micron diameter. And when a cell comes, like so, the cell has to deform in order to flow through this um, to flow through this chip here. And this is actually exactly the same what the cell experiences when it is in circulation. It has to successively constrict tactile deform in order to um, perform successive blood flow. I can play this video again because what you can basically see is here in the top we have obviously cells which have much lower deformability capacity compared to the cells here in the bottom. And you can imagine that these cells, if they, if they would be blood cells, they would circulate much less than these cells. Okay. With that being said, we measure the cells and we might examine their um, capacity to circulate in, 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 in the normal blood flow. How such, a how such a measurement looks like is um, illustrated here. Um, we take images of every cell, and from these images, we calculate uh, different values. And besides deformation and area, so basically the capacity to deform and the cell size, we have also, um, for example, the brightness, so how much light is transmitted through the cell, the surface roughness, and other parameters. And what you can clearly see from this simple plot is that we have multiple populations. Every dot is one single cell. We start with a population of very small particles with very uh, with 
various deformability values. And from our experiments, we know that these are the thrombocytes. Then we have a small population of cells over here with barely deformation. These are the lymphocytes, higher deformability values uh, for the granulocytes and the monocytes. And the biggest population, as expected, are the red blood cells um, with a fairly high standard deviation in a deformability capacity but also with the highest amount of cells. And how does it look? If we look at the images, I told you we have all these images available. We see different cell types and just pure appearance, but also we see different clots. Like here, we have red blood cells stick together. And here we have, um, for example, white blood cells connected to red blood cells. And in the bottom here, you can see um, an event which looks like a very weird structure. And what we are currently doing is we try to identify these as microclots. So maybe not only that we have the deformability capacity of the single cells, we might also, with our unbiased imaging technique, we might also find further bigger structures like microclots. And what we are doing is we use this information, we use this image information in order to train neural networks. So first of all, we develop the software for it and um, we develop neural networks in order to classify these different objects here automatically. Why do we need to do this automatically? This is simple because we measure per patient 1.5 to 2 million images and record these images. And if an image says more than 1,000 words, you can imagine how much information is in such a big data set. OK, that's for the introduction to physical phenotyping. And now we um, switch to what we have seen. In the, in, in the end of 2021, we basically published uh, this paper um, in Biophysical Journal where we reported that uh, the physical properties of blood cells are altered during the acute infection. And I want to say one thing, and this is, for me, was really surprising. We have seen that basically all cells, all blood cells, were altered compared to healthy controls. Um, but the most severe was found in the red blood cells. So again, we have a plot of deformation and cell size, and this is how healthy red blood cells should look like. They should be uh, very deformable and very homogeneous in cell sizes. And what you can see in COVID-19 is that the cell size stays almost the same, while the deformation values, they drop. Yeah, so we have a huge population here, um, which is corresponding to this type of cells or this shape of cells in our measurement. Usually, the cells have to deform into these shapes in order to also perform a simple circulation and a successive circulation in the smallest blood vessels. But we found, we found a lot of these, of these cells uh, as well. This um, can be quantified, obviously, um, here, just the mean deformation of the healthy controls and here of the COVID-19 infected um, people, so severe uh, ill people. And you see that they have, first of all, a wide range of uh, mean deformation, but what is much more pronounced and much more uh, um, interesting, was much more interesting to us, was that the standard deviation of the deformability values, they fluctuate much more in the uh, COVID-19 situation, meaning that almost all of our patients had um, wider standard deviation in, in, in the deformation values. And interestingly, we looked then at a population which we called the recovered ones. And these were patients um, relieved from the hospital um, called healthy. And what we found in, in them was that even here, we have a significant increase in the standard deviation of these deformability values. 
Furthermore, as I said, we have also not only the red blood cells and the thrombocytes measured, we also measure all the different white blood cells. And we can discriminate these different white blood cells. And therefore, we did a routine uh, checkup and just looked at the cell numbers and confirmed these cell numbers, so increased neutrophils, for example, decreased lymphocyte counts um, with the clinical data and identified that we are in the same ranges when it comes to the measurement of the, uh, cell, of the cell amounts. But what we have as well, yeah, uh, sorry, maybe, uh, yeah, that's, that's also good. Um, looking at the recovered ones, we see now that they turn back into the normal values, no significant differences um, between the healthy controls and the recovered, while we know that the recovered people, a lot of them, um, are now suffering from long COVID. While when we did the measurements, uh, long COVID was yet not an official term uh, in, in, in the hospital. They turned back to the normal uh, blood count values, and um, this might be also an explanation why um, you cannot identify long COVID from the pure blood counts. But what we have seen is, and what we have is basically further information like the deformation. And we saw that um, for the neutrophils, for example, the deformability was increased. And this is an indication for a strong activation of the neutrophils. And most interesting, in the recovered cohort, uh, this deformability does not turn back into the, into the normal values. So also here we see a elevated deformability levels. So it seems that some of the patients have still activated neutrophils even seven months after um, they um, uh, got declared healthy. For the monocytes, we saw an increase in cell volume, so we can directly measure the cell volume. We saw an increase in the cell volume um, in, in COVID-19. Um, this turned back to normal values um, after the patients were released from the hospital. For the lymphocyte, we saw a decrease in the cell stiffness. So this is for now real a young modulus. So the cells get, uh, got softer during the COVID-19 infection, and also this turned back into normal. So therefore, not for all cells, we see um, retaining differences, but for some, we do. And um, yeah, so with this, I want to uh, continue um, with our ongoing research. What is our hypothesis? Where does these differences come from? We teamed up with um, people from the hospital here and also with people from um, Berlin. And our and um, yes, some might have some people might might know Bettina Hoberger, Dr. Bettina Hoberger. Um, she is an ophthalmologist, and her technique, optical coherence tomography angiography, measures basically the blood flow in the retina, so in your eye. And how does it look like? What she gets are images like these. So what you see is um, here, um, with, without any vessels, you see the spot of uh, the sharpest seeing and around this area you have a lot and tons of different and very small vessels bigger ones and smaller ones you see that the retina really needs high blood flow in order to um, sustain uh, the activity of the retina what they found and this was basically what interested us the most was that in the smallest vessels the blood flow was reduced in post-COVID patients. And by looking at how this technology uh, measures the blood flow, you identify that it basically measures the movement of the red blood cells within the vessels. And with our findings of reduced deformability in this, uh, of, of the red blood cells, this might be an explanation why here a reduced um, blood flow can be seen. And we asked ourselves, um, 
where this phenotype comes from. And this is when we teamed up with Gerd Malokat um, uh, from Berlin. And he is doing an interesting experiment. He uses basically um, cardiomyocytes. So these are uh, cells from uh, the heart, and these cells are beating in cell culture. And what he identified is that so-called functional autoantibodies against G-protein-coupled uh, receptors, they change the heart rate or the beating rate of uh, these cells. So not only that we found that he found in the patients um, autoantibodies, but these autoantibodies were also active on their receptors. And this is what we think is a critical pattern mechanism in uh, long COVID as well, because almost um, all our patients um, show these functional autoantibodies. Um, and with this being said, uh, well, I have also some quantification here. Yeah, so this is the different types of autoantibodies against the different receptors you find. So autoantibodies against alpha one receptor, beta two receptor, NOP. Eta and mass, and um, not only that there are autoantibodies causing an autoimmune reaction, they also directly target um, specific proteins on the surface and activate these proteins, which might lead to um, non-functional uh, cells anymore. And why is this interesting to us, and why we think here the pattern mechanism is? Um, all of these surface receptors are also known to be expressed on uh, blood cells, specifically also on red blood cells and on the endothelial cells. And with that being said, I um, have to, I want to thank a couple of people in our group. Um, so this is the whole group, this is the whole group lab. Um, Professor Jochen Guck um, is our principal investigator and I need to thank uh, Ishada and uh, Elix, as well as the Spina, for the great help in, in doing all these experiments and doing all the work. Um, and definitely Bettina and her team um, for helping us out with patient samples. And with this, I'd like to thank you for having me, and I'm happy to take questions. Martin, so that was really cool. So before Dr. Chetty asks you, do you think SARS-CoV-2 infects the red cell per se or not? Yeah, that's a very that's a very interesting question. And there's also a question we are um, asking ourselves quite a lot. I doubt it, but this is just because I haven't seen yet a publication showing it clearly. While there are publications around that this mRNA in, in, in the blood, right? Um, but, you know, if this would be the effect or, and the cell, so changing the cell deformation, this would mean that quite a lot of cells would need to be infected. Uh, and, and that would mean basically in turn that I think we would, we would be able to identify this easily, right? And therefore I doubt it, but, um, this is just an opinion. Because <laughs> yeah, I think there was some data that CD147 on, is expressed on red cells and may act as a surface receptor and then, you know, may alter red cells. So the fact that the, the order antibodies is truly a fascinating concept. And I think we see this in the post-vaccine patient because these people have a diverse spectrum of hundreds of different order antibodies. And as you say, many of them are directed at G protein coupled receptors as well, as well as other cellular receptors. And it would seem that these order antibodies actually play a really important role in both long COVID and the vaccine injured. So it does, it is a new, interesting unifying concept that these antibodies may go for the red cell as well. Yeah, exactly. So this is what, uh, in, in, so this is what triggered at, us the most because you see, right, so that these autoantibodies affect already mechanical properties of cells. It changes the beating rate of the cell, which is a pure um, time-dependent mechanical signal. 
And if they also target the red blood cells, for example, then they could maybe also actively change their physical properties. And this is uh, something we are working now with a huge study, with a huge program on it, and, and in order to identify this. Why? there is yet no real description of how uh, G protein coupled receptors are interfering with the cells properties in red blood cells. This, this is widely overseen. While there are these receptors on the cells, they are not described to be functional on these cells. Dr. Chedi, do you have any comment? Uh, yes, Paul. Uh, I, I just wanted to clarify with Martin. Uh, you're measuring the deformity of cells, and with your white blood cells, you noticed that uh, in, in COVID patients, there was an increase in their deformability. And you tie that to activation of those cells. Is it that the cells uh, that are activated tend to have higher deformability simply because of migration to appropriate sites and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, so... Um... Uh, research in the deformability of neutrophils, for example, is uh, performed already quite for a long time. And it is really uh, detail, detail described. So if you stimulate cells, for example, with, LP, with LPS, then you see an immediate stiffening of the neutrophils, followed by a softening, a real prominent softening of the cells. And why is this? What is the hypothesis here? The hypothesis is that when cells counter, when the neutrophils encounter some cytokines or signal molecules which say inflammation is here. They have to stiffen immediately in order to get stuck in the circulation, right? And then they soften in order to migrate out. That's the working hypothesis. It's yet not really proven, but this is the concept which is around, which would make sense to me, right? So um, if they're stuck in the, in, in the vessels, uh, they have the time to then also invade uh, the, the tissue. Uh, can I put in a question from the audience uh, just for a moment? I'll put up the question and see what you think about it. Uh, yeah, well, so um, the resource factor is, is basically um, doesn't play any role to us. We are using um, from all patients and um, therefore, we have positive as well as uh, resistance negative uh, patients included. And um, we also do, so we haven't done yet a real correlation of those factors, right? We don't look at um, uh, the resource factor, for example, as a potential correlate for a, a specific phenotype. Well, this could be interesting for sure. Um, we haven't done this yet. We are currently working on, you know, the correlates of age, for example, or sex, or uh, uh, other, um, you know, medication, like, for example, the classical medications like uh, anticoagulants, right? So there we try to identify some correlations with the physical properties we measure. Um, but it's really work ongoing, and I, yeah, cannot really say something yet whether we see uh, any effect. What I can see, and this is maybe interesting, is that with uh, different anticoagulants in the, when, when drawing blood, um, we see that the cells change dramatically. So, for example, in EDTA vials, they are completely different than in citrated uh, blood vials. And this is, this, is a very, this is a very interesting effect. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> that means to go back to that question, which is quite interesting. So, we know that your blood type does determine your outcome with COVID. So certain red blood cell types have a better or worse prognosis. So it may be interesting to have a look if there's a difference in deformability between yeah. your major blood types. Yeah, we have measured almost um, 1,000 patients now, um, long COVID patients. And um, as I said, we are currently working Hard on the on the on the classification on the algorithms to do the automated analysis and then maybe uh, the the correlations with with all the uh, specific features. Yeah, this is highly interesting. I, I totally agree here. Thank you very much. I think we'll have to move along. I think that's uh, fascinating to hear from the other panelists when we get them involved. But we'll move straight along, and I'll ask you again, Paul, um, if you can introduce. 
um, our next speaker. Sure, thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Vanan Baig, who is a medical doctor and a scientist from Pakistan. He has served as a physician in internal medicine at the University Hospital after his graduation from Likwat Medical College in Pakistan. He earned his PhD from the University of Sutherland in discovery of novel drug targets in eukaryotic microbes. After the outbreak of COVID-19 in early 2020, his research experience and interest in targeting microbes, he has published over 25 papers on COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 in the last two years. His research paper published in March 2020 was the first to hint to the neuroinvasive potential of SARS-CoV-2, adopting the nasal route to the brain. This paper alone has amassed over 1,950 citations. His other papers on COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 <clears throat> focused on clinical presentation, treatment modalities, and targeting viral targets in SARS-CoV-2 caught the attention of international news outlets and researchers worldwide. Recently, he has published on neurological deficits in long COVID in nature as well. Dr. Baig is the recipient of the National Research Productivity Award from the Pakistani Council of Science and Technology and the Award of Excellence in Research from Aga Khan University. Dr. Baig is a scientific and medical advisor at the Long COVID-19 Foundation and Long COVID Coalition. At the same time, he is a local advocate on Long COVID-19 recognition and treatment uh, acknowledgement by healthcare bodies and national healthcare agencies at several social media outlets. And with that, we do welcome Dr. Bay uh, to give us his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, the nice introduction, Dr. Paul. Uh, I uh, would like to share my screen and uh, this is my first slide. We'll be talking about the occurrences and management of thrombosis in COVID-19 in long COVID uh, patients. So uh, I de uh, declare that I don't have any conflict of interest. The concepts that are presented here are, are deposited at uh, RG and they are shortly to be patent. So I move on to my next slide. Let's start with the basics on, uh, of, of the coagulation and, and the thrombosis. Uh, we know from our basic knowledge in, in science that endothelial injury, the turbulence, the stasis and hypercoagulability, these are the key players in, in, in the causation of a thrombus and, and an embolus consequently if it gets detached. Uh, the low levels of protein C are also the players, antithrombin 3 uh, uh, reduction in its plasma levels and increase increased platelet aggregation and a prostaglandin I2 uh, levels uh, uh, reduced in the blood are the major players. Having said that, uh, we uh, could, I mean, very effectively address the issue of thrombosis in long in COVID and long COVID patients if we know what what are the basic players involved in the process. Uh, that takes me to my next slide. Uh, here I, I show that all those factors that were highlighted in the previous slides are at play. Like endothelial injury is a major player here. You can see. So the occlusion of the blood vessel uh, that can happen at any time uh, after the platelets get adhered is playing a very vital role. Now the question, million dollar question, that, that how would the SARS-CoV-2 damage an endothelium? So it comes into contact with that glycocalyx layer, okay, which are, the, which are lining the endothelium, as you can see in the top uh, right diagram. Once it comes into contact in it, two things happen. It actually opens its uh, RBD to, to bind to ACE2 receptor. At the same time, it disturbs the, the lining of, of that glycocalyx. Now, our knowledge from diabetes, hypertension, and many other uh, diseases, which include vasculitis and endotheliitis, we know that if you disturb this layer of glycocalyx, okay, that is actually a call up for the platelet to come and aggregate. That, uh, uh, that you can see happens and can occlude the vessel sometime completely or sometime partially. So uh, with the, the viremia of uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the blood, 
if you leave any other factor, okay, it could be alone doing the game, okay, by by damaging the glycocalyx. The second big player, okay, in, in coagulation is, as, as you know, uh, uh, after this is uh, the uh, stasis, okay, and uh, what you cannot, or maybe I, I cannot see it, okay, on the slide, sorry, is uh, hypercoagulability, which is, which is playing role. Now, the question is, uh, why, why would a blood become hypercoagulable in patients with, with COVID and long COVID? Now, just imagine that the, the number of the antibodies and its flood okay, comes into the blood against uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, coupled with the autoantibodies synthesized uh, against several GPCRs. When they, they come into the blood, okay, they, they automatically turn that blood into a hypercoagulable, uh, what you call as fluid. Now, if you see the arrows running from hypercoagulability here, you can see it itself can cause uh, stasis in systemic and pulmonary blood vessels. And you know that these are the two major sites where, where the thrombus gets hit. So as of the previous slide, endothelial injury number one, hypercoagulability number two, then comes the factor known as turbulent blood flow. Now, if you if you just see here, okay, at, at the SARS-CoV-2, okay, from which different arrows are being derived, you can see that the ACE2 receptor gone down itself and its inactivation of angiotensin 2 produces hypertension. Hypertension itself causes the endothelial injury as well as the vasoconstriction that ha happens. So th these all players come into role. Uh, the reason I made this slide is that we should not forget that the basic knowledge that that uh, the basic factors, okay, which actually are known to cause uh, intravascular uh, formation of a mass made from the constituents of the blood known as thrombus are in play. So endothelial injury is playing its role, uh, hypercoagulability is playing its role. So even one of these factors is, is, is enough to cause a development of a thrombus, but here all of those basic what, players okay, are, are playing their role. So uh, hypoxia, you know, when it, it occurs, the body responds by vasoconstriction. That vasoconstriction can lead to hypertension. Hypertension then again can lead to endothelial injury, which which actually is, is possibly playing uh, the, the role okay, in, patient, in the blood with COVID, as well as when it gets carried out into that protected state of the long COVID. Just notice one thing, that the spike protein, which is present in the blood and is being shed from the virus itself, okay, and, and in cases of uh, uh, what you call as uh, uh, a spike protein being synthesized by our own cells, if it comes into the blood alone, okay, it is capable of creating that hypercoagulability that is so very bad for us. We also know immunoglobulins, we, you just heard me on this, autoimmune or formed against the SARS-CoV-2S protein. So they start playing a, 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 a role in concert, okay, to develop the thrombus takes us to our next slide. Here you will see, uh, the, this is a paper from Nature, okay, where they uh, highlighted the mechanisms, okay, involved in, in uh, COVID as a risk factors for the development of thrombotic uh, cascade. If you notice, okay, endothelial damage, which is written at the top, where there is this red star, itself is capable of activating the contact pathway leading to platelet aggregation and formation of a thrombus. What I want to bring uh, towards your attention here, which I added to this, okay, okay, is, is the second red star where you can see the antibody being engaged with the SARS-CoV-2 S protein. So where I move, where I'm moving the mouse now, when the antibody uh, or either it's autoantibody or it's the antibody against SARS-CoV-2, when it reacts, what happens is that it itself is capable of uh, driving the contact pathway. Uh, activated, okay, which then leads to platelet activation, thrombus formation, and if it detached, uh, uh, can lead to embolus and, and organ damage. Not only this, there is a key player there, okay, which is defective fibrinolysis. Many researchers who, who, who have published on, on the, uh, the, the basic uh, defective uh, phenomena involved in the formation of a thrombus is not only development of the thrombus itself, but the human body capability to not lyse it. I mean, that defective uh, fibrinolysis itself also starts playing function due to reduced levels of several uh, uh, factors, okay, which actually normally do lyse the thrombus. So enhanced formation, decreased lysis, and then there is a persistence of these thrombi, which come every now and then and damage the tissue in cases of long COVID. 
Also notice uh, the uh, uh, red star with the spike protein here, where the mouse is moving now, itself is capable of exciting the coagulation by some amyloid fibrils that you will see in my next slides. So here comes uh, the next one, which shows you that there are other players, okay, other than the ones you saw in the previous slides, like endothelial injury, hypercoagulability, state stasis, and, and th there is a known role, and now there are over three papers on this, that, that the S protein levels, okay, in the plasma of the patients with long COVID and COVID are, are at a very reduced level. The question, what does this active uh, protein C does? Okay, after combining with thrombomodulin, okay, this protein when gets activated, it actually inhibits the conversion of factor eight into eight A, and also very effectively inhibits the conversion of factor five into five A, which are the cardinal players in 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 the, in the mechanism which actually halts the process of what the uh, the thrombus generation. So if if normally it's inhibited, it's inhibiting these pathways and its levels are gone down. These inhibitions are lost in patients with COVID and long COVID. So the, normally in my and your body, this protein uh, C combines with thrombomodulin and keeps a check. If down-regulated, okay, as seen in this paper published in PLOS One, what happens is, the, and two other papers, okay, now one is in uh, published recently in Nature, that this inhibition is no more there. So there is an enhanced conversion of or activation of these uh, of, uh, clotting factors and therefore the thrombosis uh, gets carried on. This slide shows you some interesting thing which uh, Dr. Paul was also mentioning and and, and uh, some of the papers are now, now making their way onto the PubMed. This one especially talks about uh, the emerging role of neut neutrophil elastase and splitting that spike protein into some smaller peptides that you can see here in, in colored uh, uh, which are colored red, green, and blue. Only these peptides alone, okay, uh, they stay in Congo red. That means they have got that amyloid character. Come When these factors are in the blood, they are capable of driving the cascade of the clotting and leading to formation of a thrombus. So see, not the evil itself, but the babies of the evil, they are also capable of doing the, the thrombotic phenomena. When I say evil, the whole spike protein. When I say baby of the evils, these small segments of of, of uh, this S protein, which are cleaved by an enzyme in the neutrophil known as uh, elastase. They are also the, the ones which are the amyloid fibril and they stain with Congo red and are actively involved in the formation of a thrombus. So uh, th this is a summary from that paper that sh says that uh, they added these uh, 10 microgram per ml of these amyloid, amyloid fib fibrils and they saw that the lysis of the thrombus was also decreased so there is a defective fibrinolysis as well as increased formation of a thrombus with these small amyloid proteins. This slide is my favorite, okay, because it's uh, not because it's very crowded, only because uh, it could be very easily explained. Okay, let's see how, how I do that. So just see the SARS-CoV-2 infects humans, spike protein itself. Spike protein actually is combated by these Y-shaped antibodies. So there is an antigen antibody complex in the blood vessel that binds to blood cells like neutrophils, monocyte. They release cytokines. The cytokines actually makes the platelet adhesive and, and they actually start getting attached to the endothelium. So the endothelial injury that you heard first in the, in the very second slide, that when coupled with the cytokine and antibody uh, uh, mediated damage to to the endothelium actually shakes hand with each another in order to develop the thrombus. There is one interesting thing that that uh, actually I I'm, I'm just like I'm myself writing on it. Okay, no, I would like to see that somebody publishes that is the handshake that happens between the complement system and 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 the clotting system. The next slide will show you that in detail. But what happens is that when an antibody like this yellow shaped structure holds the spike protein, it activates 12 or more than 12 complement proteins which are normally present in the blood in an inactive form. And when the complement gets activated, there are three key, key players, C3 converted into C3A, C5A, and C5B9. These three products can just uh, go and slough off the endothelium from its lining the, uh, on the blood vessel. So there are known factors that damage endothelial cells. They lead to platelet activation. 
and platelet aggregation. So if you if you join the cascade, it's like spike protein, antibody attacked it, activated complement proteins, complement protein, these three which are named here go directly damage the endothelial cells. Everything that happens next is a consequence. I mean, the platelet activation, the gathering of them, releasing ADP, formation of conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin, the mesh coming and becoming a solid mass of thrombus, all are consequence of the damage caused by C3A, C5A, and C5B9. So just see, once you get this infection here in, in the B, uh, label as B, you have got IgG. That IgG could be against S protein, or is, as, can, as in the case of long COVID guys, it could be an autoimmune antibody. Doesn't matter what it's binding. If it's binding an antigen, okay, it's actually known to activate the uh, complement by a classical pathway, okay, which can generate these intermediates and that they can call, go directly damage the endothelium. Okay, having said that, also in this diagram, that protein C is uh, visible in, in the, in the uh, uh, cytokines labeled as E, you see here, that you see that the protein C levels are down because of the cytokines being up and the endothelial protein C receptors actually favor and that, that this protein C goes down because they are also down-regulated. Once protein C is down-regulated, no more check on the clotting pathway and the clotting pathway could get activated. Our next slide is going to show you uh, the effects of uh, the cytokines. You just, just see this slide, all the WBCs, the neutrophil, the macrophage, the platelet, they release cytokines which damage the endothelium, call up the platelet, build up of a thrombus and conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin job done. So this is this is a very bad, bad handshake because I can see many hands here. Endothelial injury one, okay, protein C going down, uh, leukocytes or, or, or WBCs playing the uh, uh, game, okay, by releasing the cytokines, all of them come into play. Now let's uh, talk about uh, uh, this this slide and uh, next two slides, okay. The, they would explain the, uh, th the therapies that could be actually done for addressing this uh, uh, unfortunate occurrence of uh, building of the clot. There could be thrombo-preventive drugs, which are listed here. You can see all of them and some of them are in combination with triple drug therapy are being given to patients with, with, with uh, long COVID to prevent the formation of, of uh, thrombi. Then you heard me that thrombus lytic phenomena, thrombolytic phenomena are very defective. So the drugs which are listed below the thrombolytic drugs are very well known in, in cardiology and, and stroke, okay, to be given as a therapy to lyse that thrombus. So you see this defective uh, thrombofibrinolysis can be addressed by these drugs given um, as, as a therapy. Not only this, okay, you, you, one of the papers that uh, recently has shown that the spike protein can form amyloid uh, microclots, I would more appropriately refer to them as thrombi, is actually not only the job of the entire S protein, but on the previous slide, you, you saw that even these uh, colored peptides sequences of the spike protein can also do it because they are the ones which are the amyloid fibrils and uh, which stay in Congo red and can do the job. So you see spike protein alone can do it, and, and it, its small peptides okay, in its sequence can also do the job. So let's see what, how, what they are doing uh, nowadays to manage the thrombotic complications in COVID-19. This is a flow chart of it, okay? The slide would be available through Long COVID uh, Congress and Long COVID Foundation to the listeners. Uh, it's uh, typically what, what hospitals do, uh, what the drugs and uh, stuff that are given at first and then the long-term management of, of, of uh, the uh, intravascular thrombosis and embolism. Now, that takes us to uh, the practical application of what you saw. You saw that the protein C levels are less in the blood. The reason uh, the coagulation pathway cannot be checked. So now they are thinking of giving activated protein C for the virus-induced uh, uh, thrombosis in patients. This is a clinical trial that actually is, is uh, uh, about to publish a result. So see, the, see that all those factors that you are hearing, they are not only there as a slide, but, but uh, they are being funded for their clinical trials in, by NIH and other resources. 
Now, uh, the, the, and many presenters uh, and listeners okay know about uh, FRSS and how it's done. And uh, I will uh, uh, listen from other uh, speakers as well. But uh, uh, some modifications into it, okay, which I wanted to talk very quickly here is that if you add some uh, other constituents to the chamber other than the heparin on the beads, like dust of ACE2 and NRP1 protein and a drug that could go very avidly bind the the, uh, the uh, spike protein could add value to the FRSS in my opinion. So what's the concept? The concept is that what we do here is that in viremia, we know that the spike glycoprotein is, uh, hides the RBD of, of the spike protein itself. So first is to trick it to show its core. So you expose it to ACE2 in the chamber so that it exposes that its RBD. Once the RBD gets exposed, Okay, we have done some in vitro studies, okay, where drug very avidly goes and binds to the receptor binding domain and the receptor binding motive of, of the virus where actually it binds the ACE2 receptor. So in my opinion, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, adding these uh, components or constituents to the chamber in addition to heparin could be very productive if, if tried in, in FRS is the reason uh, I, I, I consider this one. Uh, as a concept of uh, the jaw drop and clamp the tongue concept. Uh, jaw drop means you just show it the ACE2 so that it uh, drops its jaw, shows the tongue. When I say tongue, I mean the RBD. And the moment it shows the tongue, okay, the drug goes and clamps it. So uh, the blood that enters from this uh, end, okay, black, back into the person's body would have a castrated virus. You know what I mean? There would be virus, but it's as good as a dust particle because it cannot infect the cells. Why? Because the drug would, would avidly bind the site of the S protein, which actually sits over the ACE2 receptor. So in a way, the uh, virus can be neutralized when it's passing through, through this chamber. Conventional heparin beads only actually uh, entangle, get entangled with the S glycoprotein. So I think that this, this possibly could be tested uh, in, in FRSS as a additional constituents to the chamber. Natural products are, I mean, I never under, underestimate their, their value. I mean, even drugs like uh, aspirin and uh, metformin used in diabetes and, and heart patients, aspirin in heart patients and metformin in diabetes are plant derivatives. And just imagine uh, uh, half of the world approximately are, are using them in diabetes and uh, heart diseases. So uh, one of the studies which is yet in review, uh, the reason I cannot, like with the permission of the author, I only... Uh, took this part and then they showed that these constituents from these plants were, were capable of lysing the clot in vitro. And this is very exciting study to me because the constituents which I heard they have tested to lyse the clot, which actually could also light a, lyse a thrombus, are, are uh, view with very few side effects because they have been used in other diseases as a therapy. So shortly we await uh, uh, this publication and, and uh, let's see what the components are. Last but not the least are some publications of drugs as herbal compounds and they appear in not only journals but as you can see the third one has also entered into clinical trials. Okay, so the, the, anti, the antiplatelet, anticoagulant effects of, of various compounds uh, which are natural product and, and there are nutraceuticals should not be underestimated. So uh, this is an evidence that not only they make to, to, the, to, the, to the publication in peer-reviewed journal, but also in clinical trials. So uh, with this last slide, okay, I, I just like hope that whatever work we are doing very soon gets translated and, and patients start benefiting it, not only in COVID-19, but uh, the desperate treatment looking patients with long COVID and long rollers. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Bob, please. Yeah, so to say it's complicated, it, it would be an understatement. And it seems yeah. like that almost every pathway you can imagine gets activated in SARS-CoV-2. So that you get this overwhelming clotting. And it would seem that one single anticoagulant is not going to work, that you probably need a combination of different drugs what was really interesting is, you know, I've more recently, and you can be interested too in the properties of curcumin or turmeric, which seems to have a really important role in COVID. 
you know, it's mm -hmm. anti-inflammatory, antioxidant. It actually has antiviral properties. Um, it's a very potent antihistamine. Both H1 blocker, H2 blocker stabilizes mast cells. And as you said, it actually uh, it prevents platelet aggregation. So, you know, I think it's a reasonably inexpensive drug that could be added to the armamentarium for patients with COVID, because I think you'll be, you know, hitting multiple multiple pathways with with the single drug, and obviously, yeah. you know, it's cheap. So the FDA and the CDC and NIH are not going to be excited about this. That's right. But it's going to make money. But hopefully, it can, you know, improve patient outcome. Very right, and and uh, uh, the the darling drug would be the one that actually, if not uh, addresses all the pathways, but if it addresses some of, uh, of the pathways, you know, so you don't have to take many pills and many anticoagulants, okay, for and many anti-inflammatory to do the job. And that's the beauty of the natural product that if you have known it for ages, you have given it in Alzheimer's, you have given it in other neuroinflammatory diseases, you know, so it's, it's not going to be uh, uh, as, as difficult as to make a clinical trial out of it and see the result. Yeah. Do you think all these people should be on aspirin? Honestly, I, I would place my opinion here, okay, with uh, the data. You know, what I have seen and in uh, clinical early published papers, okay, it's a marvelous, uh, what you call as agent to get added to to, to the anticoagulant uh, uh, regime of, uh, of the patient. Uh, leave alone the other platelet inhibitors, aspirin, I mean, is, is a cardinal addition if it's done even not only in uh, COVID-19, but also long COVID patients. And again, uh, if I'm not wrong, okay, I, I, I learned it in my third year of, of medical science, you know, that it's uh, obtained from a bark of a tree. Again comes the plant. So it uh, doesn't matter, you call it aspirin, okay, it sources again plant, you know. Mark, yeah, or yeah, Kim, you have any questions? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much, Maran, for for your work. Uh, we were collaborating quite some weeks now on that one. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I have to let's say from the from the point of view of the of the patients and the uh, medics uh, involved in treatment of long COVID and long mm -hmm. haulers, uh, I would say that we have now, like usually, the German systematic approach: prevent, stop, and clear. Yeah? So. Uh, for each of these three points, like you say, you want to, for example, now a long order is uh, is facing reinfection. So there we have to there we have the question of how can we prevent thrombi formation uh, at early onset of this disease to not even have it come up. So what would you suggest to do, like on the prevent and preventive part, on the part of uh, stopping disease progression in this in this region, and how to clear uh, uh, the the clots? that are that seems to be another big problem because of the they're not homo homogeneous clots they are formed by different fibers different uh, substances so it's not it's a multi uh, material kind of clot so it's difficult to dissolve dissolve what, what is your take on these three steps and what see uh, if, if if i would answer your question okay i would like to see that uh, what is the pivot on which each and every of these pathways concentrating you know and you know, and to be candid and honest, when I answer this question, I'm very suspicious about that uh, stem of that Y-shaped structure known as antibody. You heard Paul, Paul saying earlier that reinfections or introduction of S protein by any ways, you know, is going to just excite that antibody formation. Once the antigen antibody complex is found, formed, you know what, what they taught me in my fourth year of medical science? We call it CICs, circulating immune complex a darling agent to rip off that glycocalyx and damage the endothelium, leave other pathways alone. I mean, so so if, if you prevent it, okay, like you said, uh, uh, as you started, prevent, treat, and close it off, okay? So that, that reinfection prevention is would be a key thing, and clearing the infection of a residual virus in a patient with long COVID should be the two tasks. Once you do it, okay, the coagulopathy would subside a bit. Then comes the fibrinolytic pathway activation, we have got drugs, okay, if the fibrolysis is defective, okay, we have got drugs which we can give that can lyse a thrombus. But you know, you can only lyse it when you know that it's going to be formed. So prevent the formation so that you don't have to lyse it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You lyse only when it's formed. So if 
the formation in the first place by whatever drug. I, I am not uh, going to advocate for any particular agent. But then if you can prevent the formation, there would be no need to utilize it, you know, because it would be not formed in the first place. What about the uh, what about the netosis um, uh, trap formation? I See, netosis, netosis is is one of the cardinal uh, key players. Okay, only when you go and tease the neutrophil, you know. So when you tease the neutrophil, okay, then it throws those fibrils, you know, and then and then all the platelet things, okay, get get activated and stuff that you saw on some of the slides, which were very complicated, I, I have to admit. But then uh, I cannot draw a very simple so plain slide there. I have to so show the confluence of multiple pathway. So uh, you are very right that, that netosis is, is playing role, but it could be inhibited by drugs. We know that, that those drugs have been used in the past. So uh, it could be done. Yeah, very right. And and so the, 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 the takeaway might be that um, in addition to what is already known and research and practiced in medical practice in long COVID and acute COVID, uh, the, to address netosis would be an additional factor to be considered. Than and, the, and, uh, and the protein C. And, and the protein C. Protein C. You just heard me. I had and two we, slides for that, three slides, okay, in which one, in one of that I showed that NIH is doing a trial on activated protein C as a therapy because they know the significance that when it goes down, you, you don't have any check on, on thrombosis. Thank you. Paul, uh, uh, Mark, please go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. First off, thanks for the well thought through presentation. I really enjoyed it. I have some questions. One from the audience. Thank you. Um, so some people are wondering why aspirin may not work, especially combined with ginkgo biloba. Um, I was going to ask you as well. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you all of them at once, and you can choose what you wish to answer and how. Um, What's the role of complement and autoantibodies in thrombosis? You've already pretty much explained that in your presentation, so thank you. So Anything you else see, to add uh, on? Um, yes, please. Carry on, Mark. Sir, and the last, uh, thank you. The last thing I was going to ask is, Shankara Chetty treats long COVID with inflammation suppressants such as Montelukast, tapering steroids, colchicine, H1H2 blockers. The FLCCC uses a slightly different protocol. Well. A greatly different protocol. You've got Beata Yeager and Jakob Laubscher focusing more on anticoagulation. As you've already shown in your presentation, we've got autoimmune issues arising, you've got endotheliitis. I thought for a long while that the microclots, the hyperactivated platelets, are a result of a downstream process, more likely to be the GPCR you know, antibodies, lots of stuff going on causing inflammation. I also know that Beata Yeager advocates for patients to take certain herbs, as well as, for example, medicinals 9, at times if appropriate. Mm -hmm. I wonder what your opinion on that is. I've asked a lot of questions. I'm happy to break them down again. But could we go with the ginkgo no, below and just like, Yeah. So uh, to, to answer it, okay, I've made bullets, okay, in my, my memory so that right. I can address them one, one by one. I would first like to comment on that question, okay, in which you asked that, uh, what would be if uh, uh, two different schools of thoughts are using two different approaches to anticoagulants, you know, which one I think that would be more effective. I'll give you this uh, example, okay, by which uh, not only um, okay, but also the audience would understand it. If you've got two diabetic patients, okay, of the same age, from same racial and uh, background, you know, tell me, okay, would the dose of metformin and the insulin unit he, he or she takes would uh, equally regulate the, bl uh, uh, the blood glucose or there would be difference? The answer is it would be difference. One would need eight units, the other would be 12 units, okay, one 850 milligram of metformin, the other actually does so very good at 500. What I want to say here is that even for the anticoagulant approach, you know, the, uh, pers the person having the disease should be individualized. And you know, results speak for itself. When you give a therapy, okay, it is reflected in the form of reduced ischemia, improvement in the symptoms, and one could respond to aspirin more than the other anticoagulant. So you know how, how this can be done? Since they are safer drugs in the sense that you don't give toxic amounts or dangerous amounts, start a therapy, see for seven days how the patient responds to it, do the blood, what you call as biomarkers, and if improvement is there, okay, you can continue to, uh, giving them. If not, go for the other one. If not, go for the AFRS. I mean, like, you have got choices, okay, but then you should 
the word is golden word is coming now you should individualize the patient individualize him or her see that what suits a particular person i guess sorry to break up the party ah i was just going to say i i think we do have to move on to our next speaker sure. but there's all those questions for the i'm going to i'm going to just like uh, give this uh, feedback individually on on the page of long covid foundation and long congress so don't worry okay, all of these answers would would come up and pop on time and we'll get a chance in the open discussion to come back to Isn't it. It. but we'll 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 Isn't go it. straight ahead yeah. thank you thank very you. much um um Th Manan. and we'll ask dr mark to introduce our, our last speaker um for this evening well hopefully not the last speaker but uh Dr. Dobrik Kiprov. So he's going to be talking on an important subject for which hopefully we will all um, learn some information because I think uh, this may be an important therapeutic intervention in these people. So Dr. Kiprov is board certified in pathology and hemophoresis. He's an internationally recognized expert in the field of therapeutic apheresis. He currently serves his patients at his private practice in San Francisco, California. In addition, he is the chief of the Division of Immunotherapy at California Pacific Medical Center, again in San Francisco, California, and medical director of the Apheresis Care Group. His experience in the field of therapeutic apheresis extends over more than a quarter of a century, while his work on the subject has been published extensively. In fact, Dr. Kivrov served two terms as the American Society of Apheresis Board of Directors and created the first ASFA education video program. Over the course of his career, he, is, he was an active part of the first trials of immunotherapy and is currently involved in various projects that involve stem cell vaccines and stem cell therapies. His extraordinary experience with immune system disorders has enhanced the development of educational programs and foster, that foster immune system health and longevity through his unique approach, which resolves around combining appealing eating habits and physical therapies. He is the author of Lifestyle in Motion, a cookbook on how to boost your immune system, prevent disease, defy aging, and control weight. So we do look forward to his important presentation because I think many of us have questions about the role of hemophoresis, plasmapheresis, apheresis in long COVID and the vaccine injured. So, so with that, Dr. Kipro. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I don't see my slides, but that's okay. Here, here they are. Here they are. Thank you for inviting me to, uh, to this uh, conference and uh, giving me the opportunity to do some teaching here. I was asked to do a short overview of apheresis in general, and I'm going to stick just to the technologies that are being used currently in, uh, in long COVID. Uh, obviously, there are other technologies, and there are quite a few in development, as you already heard. Uh, I was actually pleasantly surprised from the last talk that some of my graphics videos and other teaching materials have made it into the talks of prominent people. So thank you for that too. Uh, <clears throat> so these slides are not moving for some reason. Uh, I uh, just click right at the very bottom. You see some arrows at the very bottom of your screen, and you just touch um, to the left or the right, and it will move the slide along. So no, bottom, they're, they're right not down, moving. Uh, they're not moving. Oh, no, it's not moving on your side. Just move nope. your mouse pointer down to. Yes, move to the lower down. Lower. I'm seeing where your mouse is, so you just have to get to where the arrows are. Oh, I yeah, see. Yes, it's yes, not, yes. not so, my mouse. Oh. You're okay. <laughs> there you go. Well, it's not moving. Still not moving. Uh, um, just go into your screen. Um, just click on your PowerPoint screen itself on your screen. 
Can you see your PowerPoint screen? Uh... So on your screen itself, just bring it up um, over the um, the current studio. Uh, the, you try and roll your mouse and see if it if it rolls along. Yeah, it, it rolls along, but it doesn't hold on a second, it doesn't roll on your screen. And now I'm on your screen with the mouse arrow and it's not going anywhere. Okay, so what you may have to do is just um you may have to unshare it and reshare it again. Stop sharing. Yes, and um and share the screen again. And so whilst we're, we are waiting here, we're getting a few comments that are coming in. Thank you very, um, very much. Um, yes, so and you, FLCCC does have a, a number of um, useful documents. So click on share screen. And you're going to... Slides, right? It tells me no, again. No, not slides, not slides. You're going to share your screen this time. Screen share, OK. And then this time, when you go to share the window. All right, try and see if you can move it now. Yeah, this yeah, is there good. There you go. Excellent. All right, very good. Sorry for the confusion here. Uh, since ancient times, people believed that uh, there are certain substances in the blood that actually help to define a person and character of a person and his or her demeanor. In addition to that, they believed that there are substances in the blood that cause certain diseases. They used to call them bad humors. Uh, so in order to remove these bad substances, they started doing something known as, flip, today we call it phlebotomy, but basically is bloodletting. So bloodletting was very popular for centuries and uh, didn't go away until late in the 19th century. Its success is questionable, but they continue to do it despite the fact that some people died, including our, our first president after this procedure. So today we're a little gentler in our approach and uh, use different technologies. Aphoresis comes from the Greek, it means to take away. Uh, basically what we do today with aphoresis is we separate uh, blood components in cells and plasma, and the technology is used in donor aphoresis as well as therapeutic aphoresis. We obviously don't wanna talk about therapeutic aphoresis, and the technology is, has advanced considerably over the last 50, 50 years, and we use uh, computer computer chips in of all of our machines today, and make this makes things safer and easier. So therapeutic aphoresis is an umbrella term, and it means different things. Uh, but basically, you can remove a certain blood component, you can remove and replace a blood component. And uh, you can actually alter a blood component as well. There are two basic principles in separating uh, different blood components. One is filtration. The other one is centrifugation. In filtration, we use membranes that have pores that are large enough to allow fibrinogen, immunoglobulins, large molecules to pass through. However, they do not allow the smallest cell, which is the platelet, to pass through. This separates whole blood into cellular components and plasma. And this is how it works through, through an animation. This technology is much more popular in Japan and in uh, Europe. Uh, in the United States, this technology is limited 
to to a large extent. So we don't have many machines that work well with uh, filtration. In this country, we use centrifugal devices, which uh, separate whole blood into red cells, white cells, platelets, and plasma, depending on their specific gravity. <clears throat> Uh, these machines today are capable of removing each one of these components individually. And uh, the results are fairly clean. Uh, so I'll show you how the procedure goes. I hope you hear the sound. Therapeutic apheresis refers to a specialized medical procedure in which blood separation technology is used to remove abnormal plasma constituents or blood cells. Whole blood is removed from the patient into a blood cell separator, which utilizes centrifugal forces to separate whole blood into its individual components. Plasma, platelets, white blood cells, and red blood cells. Plasma, or a specific blood cell type, can be removed and replaced with physiologic fluids or cells to treat relatively uncommon, but usually life-threatening diseases. So there is another technology that uh, is becoming more and more popular these days, and that is uh, called double filtration. And basically what happens is that whole blood goes into a membrane filter, which separates whole blood into cells and plasma. The separated plasma goes through a secondary filter or membrane and removes a specific component. Uh, it could be IgG, it could be LDL, a variety of different things can be removed. IgE, there is interest in removing IgE in certain conditions. And this already plasma that's cleaned off a certain component joins the cells and they go back to the patient. So one specific removal, as I mentioned, is immunoabsorption of IgG. Uh, the most columns that are available today rely on protein A, staphylococcum protein A, which has uh, the affinity to bind to the FC receptor of IgG. And this way it removes specifically IgG and IgG containing immune complexes. Uh, this is the first column that we developed in the United States. Uh, and uh, I had the privilege to treat the first patients with, with this column which was a scary experience. Uh, the column worked really well and it proved itself in, in a number of uh, well-controlled, actually, chamferesis trials, but financially didn't, didn't survive in the United States. And the Europeans took over and now they make the same column or similar in several countries. I think Germany, Fresenius has the probably the most uh, significant column. It's called Globafin that specifically removes IgG. Uh, this is an example of a machine that does that. As you can see here, uh, the large, the long filter is the, the or membrane is the one that separates plasma from the cells. And then the removed plasma goes into a secondary filter to remove whatever you want to remove. This particular uh, column removes a low density lipoprotein. And then there is uh, something called HELP, heparin-induced extracorporeal LDL precipitation. If you thought that the name is confusing, let me show you how it works. Then we'll be really confused. It uses not one, but several filters. The first one separates whole blood into plasma and cells, and the plasma then goes through a buffer and heparin. And because of the different charges of heparin and LDL, LDL binds to the heparin, and uh, this is the idea here because this was supposed to remove low-density lipoprotein and nothing else. Uh, then these uh, uh, particles that are heparin and LDL are being filtered, uh, and some of the remaining heparin goes through another column that removes specifically heparin, if you can believe that. And then at the end of the whole process, there is a dialyzer 
that's necessary to purify what you remove. So this is a very complex uh, procedure. Uh, as a matter of fact, it actually works well. We have seen people who do very well. Again, in the United States, they didn't pan out. Uh, my staff and I were in charge of promoting this process and teaching people how it works and how to set up the machines, but the machine is very complicated. The original machine was even worse than the one they're using today. Uh, it does the job well in terms of removing LDL. It also removes fibrinogen, which is helpful in patients with cardiovascular disease and, and probably in long COVID as well. Uh, so this machine is no longer available in the United States. We had it for a while, but B. Braun, the manufacturer, withdrew it because financially it was not sustainable. Uh, so in our experience, we prefer to use therapeutic plasma exchange using centrifugal devices. Uh, in our experience, it is safer than all of the other technologies. It is relatively simple compared to the other technologies. It is the least expensive procedure to do therapeutic apheresis. And it removes all circulating offenders, as I will show you in a few slides. So we have been able in our experience with long COVID and other diseases as well to improve the inflammatory factor. So the SED rate drops dramatically after a few procedures. So does C-reactive protein. And uh, for the purposes of, of this particular conference, uh, we can affect coagulation in a dramatic way. Uh, D-dimer drops significantly, fibrinogen drops, and I'll show you some other. Uh, so some of the patients with uh, long COVID, especially if uh, we catch them or they show up early after, after uh, they have had COVID, they still have ferritin levels that are pretty high. And this is a large molecule, which is relatively easy to remove. So we remove that as well. Now, uh, for many years, and still the majority of, of medical practitioners believe that plasmapheresis or apheresis in general is, is uh, conforming to, to its name. If that is basically to remove something, take away. Uh, however, it turns out that that's not only the only thing that therapeutic plasma exchange does. In the early 80s, in 1981, uh, my team and I showed that there is significant phenotypic change in T cells, uh, T cells being CD4, CD8, and CD3. And we published that, uh, as I said, in the 80s. This has been confirmed on multiple occasions by different authors and scientists. And uh, as of late, uh, you heard a lot about uh, phenotypes today. And this is a major topic in, in today's medicine, especially in immunology. So we are able to affect cells and uh, move cells with different phenotype back or up, depending on what we want to do. In addition to that, over the last several years, we have used proteomics to, to demonstrate that there is no only down regulation of certain proteins that mainly pro-inflammatory proteins such as cytokines. But interestingly enough, there is upregulated and it turns out that the upregulated proteins are either other inflammatory or have other beneficial immunologic effects. Uh, this happens to be from one of our patients that was recently published. Uh, so another thing that happens that is very important and is pretty much along some of the stuff you heard already, and that is that certain cell types move back and forth in terms of up and down uh, during COVID, and certainly this persists uh, in long COVID. And uh, the majority of these patients have either mild or severe lymphopenia, which means that the lymphocyte subsets uh, go down during the disease process. And at the same time, neutrophils and macrophages go up. That's presumably that's why the notorious uh, spike protein hides. So here you can see that uh, if you look at the top level, that lymphocytes go up, CD3, CD4, CD8, 
uh, CD4 to CD494. And on the lower uh, graph, you can see that uh, the myeloid series goes down. So th there is a very complex mechanism of action of therapeutic aphoresis. Partially, we understand, and there is probably a large amount that we do not understand yet. In some patients, as you can see here, uh, the first treatment shows uh, this the plasma is pretty dark. Uh, if, if this is early in uh, long COVID, one can blame ferritin if the patients are in there. Uh, if it's not that, I really don't know what it is, but it clears up very fast and becomes opaque. This is how normal plasma looks like. Uh, <clears throat> so many of these patients with long COVID, uh, complain of dyspnea. They, they don't breathe well. And uh, the first patient that we treated showed up with a chest X-ray that looked like this. Uh, on the left-hand side here, you can see there is a remarkable changes uh, on X-rays. And after three treatments, this whole thing disappeared. Now, this was labeled pulmonary fibrosis. Obviously, after two treatments, if we see this, this was a misdiagnosis. So I don't know what it was, but it cleared up pretty fast. And I tend to believe that this was not pulmonary fibrosis because we haven't seen this clearance so fast of fibrosis in general. Uh, and I'll play a little video of what the patient felt as we were treating him. I came to Kipra's office three weeks after I had finished the uh, uh, hospital uh, stay. When I came here about an half ago and did the first apheresis, I couldn't walk off of an airplane without uh, collapsing into a wheelchair. The day after the uh, apheresis, it was as if I had a different body and uh, no longer were my lungs an issue. Breathing uh, as I was beginning to get a life back again, um, and the the difference was uh, was truly remarkable. The COVID was that I did lose my sense of smell, uh, my ability to taste. Um, my ability to taste was was actually um, as it as it came back, it was even weird until the apheresis, and then all of a sudden I was able to taste normally again. And uh, now I notice that I can smell things other people can't smell. Um, but the, the difference in the apheresis has been really, really dramatic for me. Uh, so uh, just to get into the basics here, post-infection immune dysregulation can cause a variety of different diseases. And uh, here's a mixture of these diseases, chronic uh, fatigue syndrome, pandas, POTS, uh, post-Lyme syndrome, and of course, long COVID. And uh, it, both uh, from a laboratory point of view, as well as from a clinical point of view, they have similarities. And some of these similarities are very striking. Uh, so that this suggests that the pathogenesis of these diseases is similar as well. If we look at the laboratory findings of these patients, they certainly have autoantibodies. Uh, they have high inflammatory markers, and some of them have coagulation abnormalities, although not most, most of them who have coagulation abnormalities fall into the long COVID category, which... Uh, speaks to the fact that this virus is different than all the other infections. Uh, in addition to post-infection, there is post-vaccination autoimmune syndromes. This is not new. We have seen this uh, post-flu uh, vaccines. We have seen it with other vaccines. And these are well-defined syndromes and well-published. Uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, is one of them. Transverse myelitis was really something that developed with some of the vaccines for the, for the COVID virus. Uh, obviously, long COVID can occur 
or the symptoms of low COVID can occur after vaccination. We see this called post-vaccine syndrome. And uh, what is pertinent to this talk is the antiphospholipid syndrome, which we have seen. Uh, and there is something called catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. And we treat these patients with plasmapheresis and obviously other medications. Uh, and we have published our success with that. We these people usually die, and uh, when we treat them, they usually they usually survive. So there are a lot of things that we don't know about long COVID and about this virus in general, but there are certain things that we do know. And uh, if we move forward and treat what we do know, maybe we will come up with saving some people's lives and uh, making them feel better. And in the meantime, we will continue our research into finding more and coming up with other medications and other approaches to complement what we, what we already know. Keep in mind that HIV is still under investigation. We don't have a vaccine for HIV 40 years later. And the cocktails that we use to treat HIV are cocktails. It's not a single drug. So we have long ways to go here. And we have to admit, we don't know everything, and the future will show how good we are in, in fighting this particular disease. At the moment, we do believe that along with some other uh, medications, plasma exchange is capable of removing cytokines, autoantibodies, certainly immune complexes, certainly amyloid. You probably haven't read our uh, publications, but we have finished uh, double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial of plasmapheresis in Alzheimer's disease. As you may recall, uh, amyloid plays a major role in Alzheimer's disease, and we have demonstrated that we remove it and patients improve. Uh, we can definitely remove microthrombi and uh, uh, effectively stop, stop that process of coagulation. And I mentioned the antiphospholipid syndrome, which is in a milder form of what we heard earlier today it occurs in, in long COVID and sometimes can be, can be serious because uh, it, it was well described that long COVID in some cases can cause the antiphospholipid syndrome, the catastrophic one, and certainly after vaccination, it can happen as well. So I'll leave you with that and uh, be happy to participate in any discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you. So you, yeah. So I had some questions which you partially answered. So the fact that removing these bad humors from the blood actually, in and of itself, interferes with the pathophysiologic process by up and down regulating, you know, other genes is really important, because if you were just removing whatever, you know, cytokines, they're going to come back again. Um, so the fact that you're actually altering the disease pathway seems to be important. Do you have any understanding on how that's modulated? Well, uh, interestingly enough, we, we learned a lot by uh, a model called uh, parabiosis, where we connected an old mouse to a new mouse, to a younger mouse and see what would happen if, if we get their circulation together. And uh, we found out that the old mouse became younger and the young mouse became older. So the initial uh, idea was well, there's something in young blood that we infuse and they become younger. Well, we did additional experiments and it turns out that that's not the case actually. And what was the case was that there is this change of homeostasis, we change the milieu of where cells really live. So if you take if you take plasma before the treatment itself and you incubate stem cells with this pre-plasma for resist plasma, they will die. However, if you take plasma after the procedure, incubate these stem cells, they proliferate robustly. And this led to a variety of proteomics and a lot of phenotypic experiments that we did right now we're checking 
40 different colors on flow cytometry. So the, the field is expanding. But it was a surprise to find in proteomics that certain proteins went back and forth. Uh, but it came from this particular experiment. In so now we do it in humans. And uh, it seems to, we, we can demonstrate that time and time again. So it's not accidental. So, I mean, many of these paid people, as we said, have autoantibodies. And when you freeze them, you remove the autoantibodies. So the right. question is, if you follow up these people, do they... Do they have recurrent development of autoantibodies or do you switch off the B cells so they don't make any more? So in addition to the plasmapheresis, we, we use other immunomodulatory therapies. I, I'm not in a liberty to, to share all of that for IP reasons and so forth. But uh, yes, there is the danger of, of removing antibodies and they come back. So we take measure of that and try to to help. And in our experience, you know, if we get, let's say, we, we, we run the Cunningham panel or anything that measures autoantibodies to, to antigens in the central nervous system, we do remove them. And if we repeat the same test three months later, you know, most of them are gone. Not, not all of them, but we, we, we have in some cases that we eliminate them completely and they do very, they do very well. But, uh, the truth of the matter is that when you do plasma exchange, especially for such a, a difficult and, and uh, multifaceted disease like what we're talking here, uh, you will have to use a combination of medications. So plasmapheresis is one tool, but there will be others. Uh, th there are some that work pretty well right now in combination with plasmapheresis, but not alone. So you can use high-dose IVIG in autoimmune diseases, but at the same time, you will impair the coagulation system, which is a problem here. So you can't quite use it. You have to find something else. So Yeah, um, yeah so I, you know, I must agree with you 100%. So with our, you know, our new protocol, what we, what we say is if you do you know, plasmapheresis or any of these procedures, patients should be on immunomodulating therapy at the same time to prevent the recurrence. And there are a whole bunch of, you know, readily safe and available immunomodulating drugs. Um, you know, one being hydroxychloroquine, you know, which is the mainstay of treatment for SLE, for the treatment of autoantibodies. So I think the idea of removing the bad humors and then immunomodulating to prevent the immune system making new, being activated, does seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, Paul, I love you, but <laughs> I'm not going to get involved in this conversation. Uh, and uh, one thing to note is that these, these kind of drugs are not as benign as you described them. So uh, I'll stop here, but, uh, you know, got to be yeah. careful. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, you know, this is a, this is a developing area. You know, we have, you know, we don't know all the answers. We have to try to do what we can. But I, you know, when we need to find the right drugs to give these people. And obviously, I think one has to be careful with the immunosuppressive drugs you use. Because I think if you use, you know, true, true immunosuppressive drugs, with, you know, rituximab or one of these really potent drugs, you actually may cause severe immune suppression. Exactly. And that's why we don't use them. Our, our protocol is very benign and it doesn't use any basically immunosuppressive drugs. It uses immunomodulatory approach that seems to work very well. Yeah, so I think that's the key, you know, immune modulation rather than immunosuppressive drugs. It, exactly. Mark, uh, Ancho, do you have any questions? Ancho, please, after you. Right. Hello. I have a question, which is also a suggestion. I uh, was listening to all those wonderful, marvelous uh, lectures. It's really, really interesting. And uh, what is becoming even more clear after this is that uh, in post-COVID, we really do not have uh, one color to paint all patients in the same color. We really have a very fertile ground for applications of personalized medicine here in the correct uh, sense of personalized medicine. So I think we need to have a very detailed stratification of the patient within the 
COVID into the groups for various kinds of treatment for one which is benefiting more from anticoagulation approach and another having more of the uh, needing for immunomodulation and uh, people with uh, activation of monocytes, etc., etc. So we really need to work on the categorizing patients into various uh, uh, groups. So can you please uh, tell us what are additional criteria in addition to like just, you know, generally post-COVID things which we are using uh, in your particular treatment case? Can you can you repeat that? You're breaking up. I don't know if it's the mic or something. So just, just repeat the, the last question. Okay. The question is that if we need to subdivide patients into the groups, can you please highlight what would be the hallmark of the group of post-COVID patients which will benefit from your type of treatment the most? Very, very nice. Yes. Uh, I think that the test that we, that we use, in addition to the clinical presentation, uh, are the presence of cytokines, um, pro-inflammatory factors, um, presence of inflammation, obviously, and, and the presence of autoantibodies. And I, I use immune complexes as well because they do have that. And uh, we, we use D-dimer uh, and antiphospholipid antibodies to see if uh, and fibrinogen to see if these people have some sort of a coagulopathy. Um, and uh, depending on these results, if all these results are negative, we don't treat them because I don't know what I'm treating. But if, if some of these are positive, they don't have to be all positive. And uh, combined with a clinical picture that's compatible with long COVID, then we, then we treat. So how do patients in the United States get to you? They get to your individual clinic or they somehow sent by other physicians? Because the types of the tests which you are given to patients not necessarily given in every medical practice. Absolutely true. I think that the, the way people find us is, is through the internet. I mean, I, we haven't advertised or do anything, but I think that our publications are very well known and, and people just go on my, my own website, which is basically my name, and they read the papers. Now, this last publication that we did on long COVID um, kind of triggered a, a lot of response. So we get contact information from different countries, different states. We have two clinics, one, one in San Francisco or close to San Francisco and the other one in near Miami in Boca Raton. So we can treat people on the East Coast and the West Coast and some come from Europe. So Miami seems better for them. Thank you so much. It was really very insightful for me to listen about your approach and what you are doing to patients. And I think, uh, so we had very, very productive discussion. I wonder maybe after the conference we can uh, um, somehow join together and, uh, you know, write uh, something which would be putting all those coagulation-based approaches together because right now in the literature it looks like more like uh, one physician, one approach thing. And I think that we need to have some kind of unifying theme which would be easily to navigate by patients and by other physicians as well. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm with you and be happy to participate in any collaboration. Thank you. Dobry, first. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. I went to Mulheim to see Dr. Jaeger. Um, I had help apheresis myself and plasmapheresis. I had some good you, response. Hold on. You, you, you had plasmapheresis? What did you say about? Yeah, I had plasmapheresis myself. One plasmapheresis yeah. Yeah. I had yeah. in Mulheim in Germany with Dr. Jaeger. Dr. Beate so that's Jaeger. not plasmapheresis. That's help. So, so I had help apheresis. I had 12 sessions of that. And I had uh -huh. one plasmapheresis session as well. Okay. So, so, okay. Um, I totally agree with what Ancha has said. You know, lots of individual clinicians around the world are, I won't say claiming their way is the right way, but I think we need to be collaborative and say, you know what, let's stratify patients to say if they fit this profile, then this is maybe the more appropriate treatment approach. So working together with you would be perfect if you'd like to do that. 
But I think I've seen patients who have benefited greatly from help after research specifically. I've seen some who have not. Sir, can you gauge any patient phenotypes which may predict successful treatments in help apheresis or plasmapheresis? Bearing in mind in Europe, where I am, we don't, I don't think we have plasma exchangeable, as far as I'm aware. They may be available privately. Do you have any predictors that might indicate success? Yeah, again, I, I think that uh, we heard that before uh, from Dr. Merrick. We're too early in this in this ball game. I, I I don't have these answers, and everybody's asking them, of course. And we we're learning. So at the moment, we we are uh, trying to find phenotypes that will respond and not respond. So we we're, we're using the markers I mentioned before, but in addition to that, we're really expanding on checking lymphocyte and leukocyte uh, phenotypes. And we hope that this will be the answer because there, there are dramatic changes in that. And if it, turn to, if it turns true that, that the spike protein hides in one of these cell phenotypes, then I think we, this is a big progress because we can individually remove these cells if need be with, with the instrumentation that we have or attack them with monoclonal antibodies. So yes, we're working on that. Unfortunately, I don't have the clear cut yes or no answer now. So, <clears throat> Mark, Mark asks a really important question, and we've seen this particularly with the post vaccine injured that you can have one therapy which is clearly life saving. I mean, transforms a patient from being an invalid to bedridden to being back on his, on, on his racing bike, and the same therapy has no effect on the next patient. It is a truly remarkable thing is how it has to be individualized. And it's not clear why some patients respond so dramatically to one therapy and not at all to another. So, you know, I think we need to, you know, we need more data. But it seems to be a characteristic that, you know, so treating COVID is simple. You just treat them and we know what works. But long COVID and particularly the vaccine injured, it seems that there is such an individual variation in the response to treatment. So what I think that means is that you have to keep an open mind. Patients need to try different treatments. And ultimately, the patient needs to serve as his own control. You know, the patient, will, you know, what happens to the patient is the best answer if it works or doesn't work. And I think if something fails, you try something else. It, it is an intriguing observation. And yeah, so question. we... Yeah. Go ahead. And, Thank you know, you. we, see, ahead, we yeah. see this most with IVIG. IVIG helps some patients, whereas other patients, it makes them significantly worse. and others, it has no effect. So one has to individualize treatment, and the patient must be their own control. I have another question if that's all right, and I'll split into two parts. In long COVID, we see many individuals with autoantibodies being positive. Some healthy individuals may have positive autoantibodies anyway, but be asymptomatic. When I had plasmapheresis, I had a temporary symptomatic relief, which then it dwindled, and many other colleagues of mine had said, will plasma exchange possibly be a cure which is sustainable? if people have positive autoantibodies. And the other thing is, are you at liberty to tell us if you anticoagulate your patients who are on plasma exchange? I personally have seen that with unfractionated heparin, I think it possibly mopped up whatever protein there was in my system, in the help machine, but also injecting myself. I wonder if you have any comments on that. Well, I do. I, I was hoping that Beate will be here and talk, talk about the help because... Uh, I really, despite what Dr. Baik said, I really have an issue understanding what's behind this thing. I mean, uh, again, as you mentioned, heparin can be damaging. Uh, it can cause autoimmunity. It can cause uh, formation of antibodies. So I think that doing help without really knowing exactly what's happening is, is not justified in my particular mind. And they haven't published anything, so I really, we don't know uh, what their thoughts are along, along these lines. I, I think that 
help is available in very few places in the world. It's very difficult to manage. So I don't know. I, I, I cannot buy that. Uh, the other thing is there is there is this tendency of of uh, removing certain elements of a disease. And, and plasmapheresis removes all of those, as I showed you. At this point, we don't know enough to say if we remove one thing, everything's going to get better. That's not the case. Uh, to answer your direct question related to you, people have to realize that at this time, long COVID, it's called long for a reason, is a chronic disease. So there will be no therapy for the foreseeable future that will cure it. There will be no cure. There will be treatments, a variety of different things. Plasma phoresis seems to be good now. And to answer your question even further, some patients require continuous treatment every month. Some patients do very well every three months or six months. And I don't have longer follow-up on many of these patients because we are in this thing for a year at the most. So uh, it is a chronic disease and it will most likely require chronic medical attention for a while. I'm going to, to pause everyone temporarily because we will have a chance to do an open session and I, I myself have quite a few questions. But before we go any further, I'd just like to give the opportunity to Dr. Um, Shetty. Um, Beata isn't here at the moment, sadly, so we, we've missed that extra discussion. We'll get Dr. Shetty to say some of his experience and then what we'll do is we'll all go into the open forum after that. So if you, you could hang on and um, we'll let Dr. Shetty share some of his thoughts. Uh, well, thanks, Philip. Uh, from, a, from a clinical presentation, I think everyone's on point. We're going to need different modalities to treat uh, different patients. I think there's uh, a large diversity of mechanisms at play. Uh, we've got uh, vaccinated and unvaccinated patients. We've got a virus that's respiratory and now shown to be having bacteriophage activity. We've got immune complex mediated problems. We've got spike protein that can cause issues. We've got direct injury to endothelial uh, the vessel linings. So coagulation uh, can occur in a myriad of different ways. And I think understanding the mechanisms behind each with each individual patient will help us dictate the, the effective the therapeutics that can be used. Uh, coming back to uh, uh, Dr. Manan, uh, <clears throat> he mentioned the, the presence of uh, antibodies or autoantibodies that can play a role in uh, coagulation. Uh, that's, that's very true with vaccinated patients. And I think once the vaccines wane, we're concerned about seeing antibody-dependent enhancement rearing its head. And uh, something that I found uh, unusual, uh, we in South Africa are now at a point where uh, the vaccines have been rolled out. Uh, the uptake of vaccines have slowed down. So patients uh, are coming to me that have been vaccinated three or four months ago with the last, uh, last shot. And I'm starting to see a change in the pattern of illness that was usual. The unvaccinated seem to present in very much the same way as they did previously with the viral phase that's really uh, of no consequence. And of course, uh, there is an immune-mediated uh, phase in some patients, which when, uh, when documented closely can be caught and treated aggressively. But strangely, uh, in all the two years now that I've been treating COVID patients, I had two strange incidents over the past two weeks. I had two patients coming, fully vaccinated and boosted, both on the third day, both patients well into their 70s. Uh, both patients were clinically ill with uh, severe joint pains, fever, headaches. Uh, and both patients, uh, while speaking to me, uh, felt strange and had sudden cardiac arrest. Very sudden, uh, asystole, no breathing. I managed to resus them both, but it was the first time that I've seen something like that occur in uh, both vaccinated patients. So I was concerned of the mechanism underlying this. Both had no history of hypertension or any cardiac uh, issues. It might have been an undetected myocarditis post-vaccination that triggered this. Uh, there was no atrial fibrillation or, or, or any Shakara, sign. Of can I interrupt you? How long after the vaccination did they have these cardiac arrests? 
How long after? Uh, this was, uh, Paul, this was uh, both patients had taken their last booster four months ago. Okay. It was four months ago. Both had uh, COVID illness and presented to me on the third day. Strangely enough, both were on the third day. And both, uh, all, all they did was they said that they're feeling, uh, while sitting in my, in my tent, said that they're feeling unwell. And within a period of two minutes, uh, we're asystole. No breathing, uh, no pulse. I managed, I don't have a defibrillator, so I had to rely on a solid fist. But I managed to get circulation or heart pumping again. Uh, I, all the patients that I see refuse to go to hospital for further investigation. That is a huge problem I have. And so I can't investigate them further to come to uh, the underlying pathology that's caused this. It might also be that they have uh, autoantibodies or a, a primed myo, uh, myocardium. And once they get the infection itself, it might be an immune complex mediated illness. It might be direct uh, infection of the virus, uh, the myocardial infection of the virus because of this antibody dependent enhancement. So I think we need to be very cautious. We're dealing with a wide diversity of uh, patients, vaccinated, unvaccinated, some with long COVID, some reinfected. So yeah, we've got immunology at play. We've got a whole host of things at play. So I think stratifying, uh, stratifying the patients accordingly will give us indication of what therapeutics actually work. With long COVID, we initially were doing IgE levels on patients and we found a majority had raised IgE and this made it relatively simple to, to treat. But there were a subset of patients who had no raised IgE, even though they had long COVID. And I'm suspicious that these patients are presenting with long COVID because of bacteriophage activity or some gut, persistent gut issue that's actually causing the problem. So when you look at the blood, you've got immune complexes, you've got direct injury, you've got toxins that might influence coagulation. So there's a wide diversity of things to look at. And I think the patient's going to be the one to tell us where to go. So did you say IgE? Yes, we found, uh, Paul, we found uh, raised IgE levels in uh, long COVID yeah. patients and quite drastically raised in the yeah. 4,000s. So, you know, that's a really interesting observation because we, we know a whole bunch of patients who had no allergic diathesis, no history of asthma, eczema, any allergic disease, who got the vaccine and then after the vaccine developed a whole host of allergic diatheses, eczema, asthma, and when you measure the IgE and eosinophils, they were off the roof. So somehow the spike protein somehow is calling this B cell class switch, and these people who were who did not have an allergic diathesis are now presenting like, you know, they've got some IgE-mediated disease. Yeah, and we've, many, uh, and we've also correlated the decrease in IgE with treatment to the uh, abatement of symptoms. So clearly, there's, uh, there's something uh, allergic going on. <clears throat> but it's the, it's the patients that didn't have the uh, high Ig levels that we struggled with. And now that uh, Carlo Brogner has brought in the bacteriophage activity and the toxin production in the gut, uh, these patients without high Ig might just be toxic from absorption of toxins being produced by bacteria in the gut. And that will yeah. affect everything in a whole different way. Yeah, so that theory is interesting, but I think we have to be a little bit cautious, you know, because you don't want to go down a path until it's we have really good data. I think the fact that, the you know, you have bacteriophages makes a lot of sense. Um, the fact that these toxins are made is somewhat interesting, but I think we need a little bit of more caution because, you know, otherwise we're going to go down this uh, cobra venom path, which which may not be a good pathway. So, you know, I think we need more evidence that these so-called toxins in the gut are actually being absorbed and have systemic levels. I'm going to let um, Abdul um, Manan go first and Josh him. And I think Mark has a question. So go, go ahead, um, um, Manan. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Shetty, you know, like uh, uh, with uh, uh, the immune complexes that you, that you heard, you know, the, in the presentation in one of the slides, okay, the Y-shape antibodies, the FC portion has got a very important role, you know, it, it's it's sort of a blind uh, stem of the Y, you know, wherever it gets a receptor, it will bind and it's going to activate the complement cascade and then the complement sings the song, you know. So some of the complements even drive eosinophils and basophils to release 
the, the content, you know. So it, it could be started by the antigen antibody, uh, anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibody, spike protein antibody, and then the complement uh, actually drive the leukocytes and, and cause the, the IgE production. That could be one route, you know. So your cardiac arrest patient, okay, I've got an interesting thing on there, and as Paul said that we uh, uh, until you have a hypo hypothesis, you never will have a data. And when you have a data, okay, then you speak, you know. But then the thing is, even the heart uh, pacemaker cells are supplied by the right uh, sinoatrial artery. It has got an endothelium. If you erode it, okay, there could be a thrombus. And if it's occlusive, okay, the patient gets the SA nodal pacemaker function shut down immediately. One way. The other could be direct effect of the virus on, on the ACE2 receptor. So it's, it would be interesting thing to see your patient survived. Otherwise, a topsy could have told the, the entire story. You know, a thrombus in the uh, sinoatrial artery would, would speak for itself. So uh, I think that uh, it's, it's very lucky for them that you were around. Even without a defibrillator, doing it is, is remarkable. And, and we, as we get the data, okay, we publish and then we come to know that the direct attack on the pacemaker cell was there and, and we can uh, like really comment on that. Joachim, go ahead. Yes, uh, very quickly, because uh, Shankara told me that some days ago, and um, it might be coincidence, possible is only two cases, but uh, they, they occurred within a week, and they occurred within three days of uh, COVID-19, um, probably some Omicron sub-variant uh, symptom development. So that is, of course, a very worrying finding and uh, occurrence, because if that plays out now in more patients, then it will change the way that you have to look at these patients in a dramatic way. Because until now, Shankar and me were breaking our brains about what this eight day phenomena is that you would see a severe course of disease after eight days, pretty much in all individuals and pretty much with all strains of COVID. So if in, in a, if there's a, so it can be a new strain in combination with maybe a prevalence in spike protein, be it by further infection or vaccination, and that combined causing cardiac arrest, um, if that occurs more often now, then we should really be alert because that will then bring the patients into some dire situations when they're out and left without outpatient treatment at home. And this occurs, many people will not make it. Um, Mark? Uh, Joachim, just to Sorry. clarify, uh, if it was related to uh, a new variant of vaccine, I'd expect to see a broader spectrum of patients presenting with the similar kind of uh, symptoms. But in the patients that are presenting unvaccinated, <coughs> excuse me, they seem to have <clears throat> the same uh, pre mild presentation and good recovery. I haven't seen that kind of... I I'm very suspicious of this being a vaccine-induced sort of priming. Uh, so that uh, vaccinated patients, when they develop these antibodies, uh, when they get an infection, there is some sort of target. I've had three patients now on the third day deteriorate. Uh, and I have a patient uh, that uh, had a telephone consult with me. Her partner has been infected for the third time. Uh, in the first two infections, she deteriorated on the eighth day. Uh, the first infection on the eighth day led her to hospital. The second, she st promptly started steroids and antihistamines on that, that vital day, and it was again the eighth day, and we still seem to be struggling to wrap our brains around why it was that day. But she wrote to me today to say her partner has been infected again for the third time, but this time the deterioration occurred on the third day, and her partner is not vaccinated. So I think with repeated COVID infection, we might have priming as well. And the mm. disease progresses a lot faster to that uh, hypersensitivity or immune mediated phase. Uh, Mark, go ahead. You wanted to ask a question. Thank you. So I fell ill in, well, the second time in October 2020. I'd been more in AA, the emergency department, um, and also as a general practitioner. We'd seen, as an emergency, we'd maybe see a few people a year coming in as a diabetic emergency, DKA diabetic ketoacidosis. I remember from the start of the pandemic, so February time or January, February time or so until the October, we had multiple people coming in and I can only see that as being an autoimmune mediated issue as a result of COVID. On the back of that, uh, the question I previously asked Abdul Manan was, I mean, I've been treated 
various ways. I went back to Jaeger to Germany for help after research and anticoagulation, which helped me a lot, but not fully. I sought treatment with you, Shankara, thankfully, and that's helped me a lot as well. We've got people with different treatments, and I wonder if today we can maybe consider if there's one unified thing we could recommend certain phenotypes rather than just postulating this might help, this might help. So while we've got Shankar talking about inflammation suppressants, such as Montes H1, H2 blockers, the FLCCC talking about hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, uh, we've got Dr. Jaeger and Dr. Laubscher focusing more on anticoagulation, and also Dr. Jaeger telling people medicinals 9 and other nutraceuticals may be of benefit. I think this is all a downstream process, long COVID. It must be from autoimmune activation, from inflammation, coming from spike proteins, from viral persistence possibly, causing coagulopathy. Do you think there's any way that we could combine? Uh, can, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I come in on this one here? Uh, the, yeah. the part of what I, I have always been interested in is that I believe that if you don't get to primary pathophysiology, you will go in a circle. So the big challenge is to be able to identify what mechanism is causing this wide variation of symptoms and um, pathology. I, I've always said that I believe that severe COVID-19 and long COVID is a viral mediated autoimmune disease. And that's what it is. The question is, what is the trigger? Based on our research, we thought that the trigger was the levels of serum ACE2 for severe COVID-19. In the context of long COVID, however, because you can have mild COVID and still have quite severe long COVID, that is a different mechanism. The only thing that I can say, and this is where my research is pointing to, everything seems to come from a persistently activated immune system and there are only three places it can happen, skin, breathing, or gut. And for most of the people <coughs> that I see, they have gut-related symptoms. So essentially what I think is there is an overlap in that autoimmune response between what was happening in the gut before, and this is what's driving the long COVID. And if it is not identified, you will continue to go in a circle. And that's from a clinical and research perspective, the only thing that makes sense because the immune system knows to switch off after three weeks. Even if you have yeah. a reactive arthritis, if you have pleurisy, if you have a pericarditis in a month, you are better. The only way that you can have persistent immune responses is if there is a trigger or a driver for this immune thing. And there are not many places that can do that. That's my clinical research perspective. Yeah, Philip, think on the back of that, oh, Philip. Sorry, do you think on the back of that, Philip, that in shank protocol of calming the immune system down would be beneficial to calm down the coagulation rather than just target the coagulation issue? I think the analogy that Shankara painted to me was it's like getting, well, depending on what protocol you go down, might not be appropriate for the individual patient, but it would be like having the kitchen, the kitchen sink overflowing and you get the mop out and depending on well, what's going on, you might not be targeting the right patient with the right medication. Yeah, well, when you look at autoimmune diseases, it, it, they are not straightforward. That's the first thing. If you're managing SLE, there is no drug that works every single time. You know, there are certain drugs that work largely but patients are very very unique and this is one of the things you see with all of these autoimmune diseases rheumatoid arthritis you know sle it, it, you need a very focused patient center approach and yes i agree that the more tools that you have in your toolbox the better the outcomes will be but you you if without an understanding as to primarily what you are targeting it is extremely difficult to find solutions for an individual patient. But I take it, uh, I take it from the lines where uh, Dr. Philip le left it, okay, that at the end of the day, what uh, is common is antibody. You know, the word that you say as a surname is antibody. Antibody against spike protein, antibody against self-antigen. 
so if you just concentrate over that antibody okay the how it actually amplifies the inflammation by activation of complement or cytokines uh, the question mark asks is that uh, is there a therapy okay which can actually hold on to the, the amplification the answer is yes and and surprisingly the answer is in many herbs okay which i am amazed i got myself interested into it okay after covid and long covid there are certain herbs and 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 plant derivatives that can contain the multiple pathways of inflammation so yeah there is an antibody but if you can't actually stop the production of it why not actually have stop the amplification of it and i'm sure that we will get our answers here i'll quote one thing dr philip okay you know in rheumatoid arthritis okay you give a very heavy doses of anti inflammatory drugs okay previously you had i mean ansads of which cause ulcers and bleeding we have to stop it the question is that it has got a history that we give anti inflammatories long covid is new but pathogenically okay it's not a different disease it's all stemming from the cytokine flooding you know so any drug which has got effect on multiple pathway be it a herb or or a novel drug if it can recede it back to the, the the cytokine production and it could lessen it it's going to answer the question most possible yeah go ahead joshua yeah i mean um, it would be nice if we can uh, find the most upstream valve and the most upstream cause for all this and until then we will have to work maybe on target or even downstream to mitigate the consequences of the uh, cytokines and whatever happens but just um, to throw in another curveball i mean we do have a lot of direct viral damage even pacemaker cells in the heart being directly infected you have um uh, prion formation in the brain and so on so the list is practically endless more than 200 or whatever mechanisms that are well reported in evidence based uh, li literature so um i i it would be a dream if you can bring that all to one single cause but i think that in the meantime we should really uh, keep looking as we are doing today and to expand our knowledge on the different uh, mechanisms at play and see for ways to how to uh, identify them diagnose them and treat them that is the only way we can go step for step in the right direction i i so, wanted to take the to answer that, sorry. oh sorry go ahead mark paul go ahead so we do have what the upstream event is it's quite simple the upstream event it's called the spike protein that's sure. what that's <laughs> what triggers this and it does all kinds of really bad things that thing people had no imagination that could ever happen so what i find intriguing is the spectrum of order antibodies in long covid and in post vaccine injury so the, if you have a, if you vaccine injured you have order antibodies there's no question there isn't a single patient we've seen that's been vaccine injured that doesn't have order antibodies and they have hundreds of them i mean they you know they send their plasma to germany and whatever they have hundreds of order antibodies and the question then becomes why is the body making so many order antibodies against the spike protein why is it happening So one of the theories is that you know when they give the RNA we have no idea about the quality control we have no idea about the length of the mRNA we have no idea about what is actually being transcribed so the likelihood is that it's not all the same you know 1400 amino acid spike protein because i think they have such poor quality control in the mRNA that the body is transcribing all different kinds of proteins and because of this they're mounting an uh, an a, a, a profound plethora of auto antibodies we know no we, we do not know what's in these vials we're not allowed to reverse transcribe them there's some people that have actually looked in the vials there's no rna no rna they're just contaminants So Pfizer and Moderna are playing games with us because we do not know what's in the vials it's probably not the same thing in each vial and there's likely could a profound diversity in the messenger RNA structure resulting in all kinds of proteins being transcribed um which is I don't know it's com it's really intriguing and I think you know the regulatory bodies need to actually define what's in these vials what is in there 
what RNA, what are the additives, what are the added constituents, and, you know, what kind of RNA is in there? Because I don't think the quality control is such that every, that, you know, every patient gets the exact same amount of, you know, RNA for the true spike, spike protein. So there are a lot of unanswered questions. We'll take that question from Ancha and then Mark. And then I just wanted to capture Valentina's thoughts about the perspective from the long COVID patient point of view. Go ahead, Anja. Yeah, I want to return everybody to our everyday reality where we have a lot of patients with long COVID. I have seen the recent model, which kind of scary, which says that uh, to the year 2026, with the current model of the pandemics, we will have 14% of the people on Earth who would have one or another form of long COVID. And that is really having huge implications for everyday life because it's a lot of people who cannot work as they supposed to work. So I think that we need to think about the approaches of the scale up of any kind of interventions which we are trying to invent. And I think already at that stage, we need to think about some kind of layered approach where probably with the most common and available to people, cheap, not necessarily requiring detailed biomarker analysis. This kind of approach, we will say, get some result, not in every patient, but say in 60% of patients. And maybe this result will be not 100% back to normal functioning, but 70% back, that would be good enough. And then we have next layer, and then we have next layer, and we also will have, of course, various kinds of uh, high technological solutions, uh, which, as it was mentioned here, help aphoresis is not very easy to use, and probably we couldn't count on having help aphoresis in the every clinic on earth established because patients need it. So I think that uh, we need to think and put together something like a layered approach, which we could present to people already at that stage. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you. As a clinician, I like to practice holistically. I don't like to just prescribe something because I can. Patients can often help themselves, be it through dyes, using natural remedies possible however sometimes we do need to prescribe and i just wonder what the collective thoughts and everybody here would be of using herbal remedies as a prophylactic and also as a treatment covid and non-covid and uh, i'm referring to that medicinal nine or its individual components for calming down spike protein autoantibodies coagulation issues it's proven in trials to be effective Individually, however, if people were to, for example, purchase uh, curcumin, hesperidin, I don't think that bioavailability would be as effective. If you look at things like Montelukast, H1H2 blockers, it may not be as effective depending on how the body processes them. But I just wonder what your concept, what your thoughts are of this. I've also spoken with Valentina, um, and she shares a viewpoint that, you know, we need something safe and natural first, as a first line, and then move on to other things such as prescription medicines if needed. What are your viewpoints on that? Well, if, if I may, I don't know, to, to interrupt here, from perspective of a normal person who already lost a job, lost house, uh, going to something like help of resources or traveling to another country to have anything significant mechanical done is very costly and it's, it will cause more financial burden to a person. Then there is a huge question whether it will help. And we still don't know. We, we can't be 100% sure that mechanical intervention help. Now, we know that it may for some time, which is great. But then my point would be here to, 
to mention safe solutions which went through trials and uh, as a foundation we we always keen to look for these solutions and uh, we had an interview on medicinals we also had an interview on artemic rescue which is a swiss company development as well so they all work towards finding great bioavailable natural compounds to at least help with symptoms now why not to develop a joint protocol uh, a first line a second line a third line protocols uh, combining all this knowledge that we already have from three congresses and maybe put them in terms of the cost in terms of the results that we already see in terms of it being safe so these solutions already exist we already know we have this data and we had it on our channel presented as well so if these solutions don't work then people didn't have much to lose they they can go towards the second line treatment uh, related to coagulation for example autoantibody treatment which is which will have side effects of course on gut on other issues or neurological issues but it at least people will try safe solutions first and in case it doesn't work not necessarily people would go to heavy stuff straight away so this is something that we have in mind for people who financially struggling uh, and need to improve so paul uh, sorry for interrupting so just to just to answer mark so i mean we have at least two randomized controlled trials using curcumin showing a profound improvement in outcome we have a randomized controlled trial of nigella sativa and honey showing a dramatic improvement in outcome we have zero data on remdesivir zero so it's it's perplexing that remdesivir is the standard of care in this country almost every single patient gets it and there's no data zero to support it yet you have these nutraceuticals that are safe and effective you know we would like more studies but there are studies there they have profound physiological basis scientific rationale so i can't see any reason why these nutraceuticals should not be a part of any treatment algorithm um they're cheap they're readily available across the world supported by basic science as well as clinical science you know um you know the ivory tower wants randomized controlled trials we actually have randomized controlled trials and yet they're not good enough so i don't know mm -hmm. go ahead josh yeah? yeah look um we are facing this um situation on a daily basis that means um we our our colleagues and teams have gone through i don't know now uh, twelve thousand hours each person involved in the last two years and whatever few months looking only at the angle of multi pathway addressing compounds bioavailability combination possibilities different angles every new thing that comes up uh, being reported as a detrimental mechanism in COVID or long COVID we are looking at it we turn around every stone on each nutraceutical or dietary supplement is available on that and so the protocol is growing and depending on the individual situation of the patient there are different uh, nutraceuticals and dietary supplements that can be combined uh, there is still a huge challenge out there to um, to develop new products which I cannot do or we cannot do as the distance alone uh, for example uh, you you're aware of the situation with the gut dysbiosis gut brain access and the whole situation also with this um, SARS-CoV-2 infecting the bacteria in our guts and leaving a, quite a disaster there after the acute infection so that that means um, um, other companies now to come into the ring so we're inviting now other teams that can put these uh, missing products together that can be of help and then this plays again into the amino acids that are depleted like the tryptophan and the and the uh, let's say the precursors for uh, for uh, for neurotransmitters you, you see a lot of long haulers taking ssris 
and I keep telling them, I said, why, why don't we try better to raise your serotonin levels in the first place? Yeah, so that the, these are cascades that are interrupted either by the virus or by dysbiosis or bacteriophage behavior or inflammation. So that is all fine. The dilemma comes when we have patients or, or clients that go, I, but I'm on this and this medication. I get on a daily basis, we get lists of up to five, 10 or more medication protocols, pharmaceuticals that are being um, used um, for treatment. And so to combine nutraceuticals with pharmaceuticals is actually a tricky business because of certain enzymes that will then accelerate or slow down the metabolization of these drugs. And that is very dangerous. And that needs to have medical supervision. Best is to do it alternating. We saw that with apheresis. We saw that with Miraviroc. We saw it with other treatment protocols. We saw it with coagulants and other, even other in nutraceutical interventions. Better not to combine too much. Better go targeted for a few weeks or a few months on a single or on specific treatments and then change and alter. And like that, you see all of a sudden that there is a complementary effectiveness in overall outcome if you watch what the patients are reporting and what the data and the biomarkers are saying. So I think that from my side would be right where we stand right now. Go ahead, Dobre. Phil, uh, I'm really sorry, but I have another meeting in about a minute. Yes, I'll have no to worries. leave. Thank you. Thank, so you. Uh, Thank you. I'm ready for collaboration. Dobre. Whatever you decided, just let me know. Nice meeting you all and good luck. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make a controversial point here. And um, I'm sorry to be brutal towards patients, but it's not that I'm being brutal. I'm trying to be honest. Um, as I said, I have been observing pre-COVID very consistent patterns with patients who have strange symptoms. I'd see them all the time in clinic. And over 90%, I'd say even 95% of them were having connections with their diet. They were just eating stuff that was making them sick. And, and, and I'd say to them, don't you think that this is a contributor to what is going on? And it's very hard to get patients to think about this. But it is, to me, the most important point when we speak about the association of dysbiosis and long COVID and gut symptoms. If, you, if a patient does not deal with that, no amount of drugs is going to solve the problem. And I will say it quite honestly, because it's, it's an education to get patients to understand this. When we're talking about autoimmunity, and even histamine links, there has got to be a driver. And consistently, I am seeing that driver in people's diet, but nobody wants to face it, talk about it, or quite honestly, deal with it. Can I just say, when people talk about diets, people often think it's a temporary thing. <laughs> often diets should be a lifestyle change. For example, if you want to lose weight, that's one thing. Is it for a certain event? Are you going to eat healthily? Are you going to reduce your dairy, reduce glyphosate, for example, consumption? Are you going to eat organic? Sure, these things may be really expensive, but these things, people talking about diets, often it's short-lived. We need to think about long-term and long-term affecting our health for the benefit of our health, not just temporary things to fit into whatever clothes we might want to, to have. What do you all think? I think we need to do this as a long-term thing rather than just, you know, let's do this for three months, feel better, get back to how we were, and then also see that we were feeling as we were before. Yes, absolutely. And this is the point that I, I, I try and make to people is that if the long COVID, from a clinical point of view, is oftentimes an exacerbation of a pre-existing problem. It's not random. And that's the most important thing that I say to patients. It's there because there was something there before and it is now being exacerbated by the spike protein. If you don't deal with what was there before, you are going to struggle to get beyond the symptoms. That's as frankly as I can probably say it, uh, but it's not necessarily what people want to hear, but it's truthfully what I see from a clinical perspective. Go ahead, Manan, you're going to make a point. You're muted at the moment. Yeah, I'm just opening it. So uh, uh, just taking it from your lines, you know, that uh, there has been something 
which actually is continuing. Uh, and uh, guys know here, okay, that I daily would like to make a point that there is a persistence of the virus, you know, at places in the body where there are high doubts, you know, it comes out, challenges the immunity. Then Dr. Shankar comes that hypersensitivity. If you keep on doing that, you will have IgE, IgG. So this mixed picture, you know, when you, when you say that, that it had an initial event from where it came, that event in real never ended. Hmm. You know, it's very convenient to call it long COVID, but tell me where is the long part of it? I mean, like I see the disease so active. You just go and see the Twitter, okay, guys saying, like we can't leave the bed, okay, they're bothered. The disease is active. The, the name would be long, but there is something which is re-exposing. So if there are vi viral hideouts like gut, it's crypts, okay, number one, sinuses, number two, places in the body where the blood doesn't have an excess directly via capillaries, eradication would, would sometime uh, will come, okay, you'll see that it will, uh, it will merge down to the point that eradicate the S protein in the first place from the viral sources, that's going to be some, some cornerstone if it uh, turns out to be so. So yeah, I mean, like uh, I, I was just picking from your lines when you said it had an initial cause and then something is there. It struck me, okay, that this, these are my lines. I used to, I, I say this, I mean, like why it's so difficult to understand that it has got reservoirs inside, okay, but it hides out even within the, I, I said it once, okay, like it's in the military camp. I mean, it's invading the lymphocytes and within the lymphocyte, it's there, okay. Just saying, here I am, okay, you want to kill me, okay, I'm here. So there, there are hideouts. Until and unless you address those hideouts, okay, we, and you are right, okay, we'll be sim treating the symptoms. Six months, yeah. like Mark, you said, three months on, three months off. We'll be going on, playing this this table tennis, okay, and the, we'll just see the ball circulating. Who is going to address that from where the ball is coming? You know, That's, that's yeah. the point. So, so I, think just... that, I, I think that a number of points are coming up with regards to where are the viral reservoirs. And and this this emphasizes okay. the point well, with regards this question, to... This question, possibly it came, yeah, possibly it came at a point, okay, where I didn't mention the reservoir. Uh, and now I did, okay, minutes ago, that it could be cut crypts, you know, and you have got an intestine, okay, which is 25 feet long, you know, and just imagine the crypts, okay, where it could hide. The sinuses are there, maxillary, frontal, okay, ethmoid. It, it, it could be places, retrotonsillar uh, spaces, tonsillar crepts, you name it. I mean, like, I know places, okay, in the body where it could just sit and the blood vessel has got no excess. Mark was asking me last time on Twitter, okay, wh why doesn't the drug go there? And uh, the capillaries don't reach those crypts in empty spaces, you know. It's there within the flood and it uh, suits it, okay binds to the ACE2 receptor, comes inside, challenges the immunity again. Now my long COVID patient has got symptoms. Okay, he comes flare up. Okay, few days, take some anti-inflammatory, some drug. Well, why do you have a recurrence with plaques of it? Okay, just imagine. It's antiviral. You know, it should go kill the virus. Okay, story done. But there is there are some places where even plaques of it is not, not approaching. Okay, those, those are the places which I call as the reservoirs. They will discover more. But until and unless you, you address the reservoir, hideouts of this virus, the symptoms will come and go. Okay, that's... that's. Uh, yeah, I, I think that this is one of the things that I remember that um, the research from the Bruce Patterson, when he looked at the fact that See. spike protein See. in macrophages See. is existing for 15 months. See. Uh, and See. again, it comes back to the point that the immune system has an off switch. It normally switches off. And so the question has to be, this has to be driven by something else and the two are overlapping and this is what i'm starting to think is that what we're seeing here is an overlap almost where if there was an activated immune system before and it gets infected by the macrophage suddenly you yeah. have two activation points yeah, and yeah. it just doesn't settle so you you have to find where primary immune triggers are coming from as you said, I have the sinuses are a brilliant point. I, I think I'll think about that. Is that if people have no, I've published on that. I've already and, published you know, on that. That's right. And so, yeah. Sorry, Joy. Go ahead, Joy. Now, very quickly, just uh, to to bring maybe one of the biggest factors to the table. Uh, we had an interview last Friday, Valentin and me, with Dr. Sender from MIT, and she is like, I've been working with her before COVID for many years on the issues of dietary 
uh, of food-induced uh, um, chronic illnesses and autoimmune disease. And if you look at certain herbicides, they are massacring our, our biome and at the same time uh, impairing the mucus layer, inflaming the epithelium and blowing, as you can watch it under the microscope, blowing the tight junctions. So the, the, the tight junction integrity, or what you call leaky gut, is one of the main factors in at least triggering autoimmune disease without COVID. Well, just like what you see from uh, many young people now developing autoimmune disease can be can be fueled for a big part by this process. So the, our next step will be together with the probiotics and with the amino acids also to add two more things, chelating toxins in the gut and to restore the tight junction integrity, which can be done with certain molecules and with certain protocols that don't cost a lot of money and that have proven and even are patented to do the job. Because once you have you get your your uh, very integrity back in the gut and in other parts of your body and maybe even in your endothelium <laughs> and nobody talks about that as well you know brain, blood brain barrier then uh, yeah. you you are closing off because the epithelium and the endothelium in my layman understanding is actually what what is like making us human defining us that is our barrier to the outside world if they are compromised you will have a continuous influx of uh, uh, um, uh, 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 allergens and, and toxins and things that will fuel any kind of autoimmune disease and anti antibody production. Okay, that was very short, sorry. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to take the opportunity, uh, this is brilliant, but I, I think we do probably need to close off at this point. We're over the three hour mark and uh, I suspect we could just keep on talking. So what yeah. I'd like everyone to do is to just do a 30 second as to what they think is the future. Where should we go? How should we do it as we close out towards the end? And since you're right at the front, Shankara, uh, do you mind uh, if you go first with this? Okay. Uh, Philip, I think uh, <clears throat> from a clinical perspective, patient uh, perspective, I think we're going to have to identify both in acute and uh, chronic illness uh, what the causative factors are. And I think patients will present differently. Those with autoimmune issues uh, presenting with long COVID, those with uh, bacteriophage problems or, or gut issues, uh, those that had pre-existing gut conditions that now present with long COVID. So I think a very comprehensive history taking is vitally important. Vaccine history, uh, the dates involved, uh, and the clinical presentation will be vitally important in trying to elucidate the underlying mechanism and dictate where we start with the treatment. Yes, we've got a broad uh, variety of different treatments from nutraceuticals to our pharmaceutical interventions to apheresis, uh, but I think uh, it'll be dictated by the presentation of the patient and the duration of the illness itself. So an acute patient that requires help immediately, we'll have to defer to pharmaceutical interventions. But once that patient's stable, we can move on to uh, nutraceutical interventions for the longer term. So I think... Uh, Understanding the underlying mechanisms and the diversity with which this virus can actually affect the different systems is vitally important in us designing and choosing different therapeutic interventions. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Paul, uh, your thoughts at the end? Uh, you're muted. You're muted at the moment, Paul. Paul, uh, you're muted. Yes, sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yes, sorry. Thanks. I, and I have to go in a second. I agree with Shankara. I think um, we need more data. We need to continue on this path. But I think it's important that no two patients are the same. So we have to figure out how to individualize patients according to their own clinical scenario and situation. Because clearly there's, you know, no one solution fits all. It has to be individualized. And I I think we've still got a long ways to go in, in order to, you know, determine which patients respond best to which therapy. Um, and with that, I thank you. Uh, it was a great conference and I, I unfortunately need to jump off now. So thank you. I appreciate thank you. it, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, Manan, your, your thoughts? I mean, like, uh, uh, I'm just thinking that uh, what a wonderful discussion we had, you know, and I'm saying that only because uh, so many niches of research okay come converge in one congress you know 
it's very rare to find uh, something like that. I would like to just end here, okay, by, by saying one thing. If you have got a smoke, okay, you have got a fire. You, the smoke is the symptom and the patient, okay? The fire is something that you need to recognize and you won't have a smoke till you have a fire. Identifying the fire, okay, where it is and targeting it is the mainstay therapy of long COVID. And if we fail to identify the, the, the fire, okay, what actually is causing it, we'll be treating symptoms, okay, not the disease. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure uh, to be here with the panel and the speakers. Thank you, Manan. And uh, Mark? Uh, well, firstly, thank you everybody for presenting today. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for being part of it. I think I agree with everything that's been said so far. So individualized medicine is really critical. It's easy to self-prescribe things. And I've read so many things on Twitter and Facebook about people being so yes. desperate that they're buying medicines from somewhere and sometimes causing harm to themselves. I just want to say that please get supervised, get a clinician who you trust who understands and who listens to you uh, to be able to find that fire, to then extinguish it, to get rid of the smoke as well, as Abdul says. I think it's really hard. We're still trying to figure out what long COVID is. And one presentation in one individual, may, but the reason may be totally different to some same presentation in a different individual. So something like anticoagulants may not work in two people. I think we need to keep on looking. I think we need to keep on meeting up, discussing, collaborating, figuring out what other studies are needed to be able to convince our governments, our health services to listen to us, take long haulers seriously, and not be fobbed off with get therapy, with psychologization of problems when there are actual organic issues going on. It's quite hard though, as a patient and a clinician myself to get peers to listen to me I have peers who are now sympathetic, but it's hard. And I can imagine all those people out there who are yet to find clinicians to understand what's going on. I hope together we can meet up again and discuss what we can do for long haulers in the future. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Joshua? Yes, and yes, several things I want to say, first of all, as we um, look back at this conference, we, we could see that red blood cell plasticity also plays a big role, and um, we didn't really uh, speak about that. So you know, we will do some follow-up with Martin and other participants of today's uh, conference to, to further really elaborate on these things that were maybe not discussed today. And they, as in the last conference, I'll um, send out an email by tomorrow with everybody to everybody and just like to recapitulate, do some maybe have some homework and some further exchange to deepen our understanding because we, we should not just talk about these things, we should also further invite other scientists to participate in this. And uh, as the outlook for uh, how to go on from here, I would say that we have to invite now um, other companies or scientists that look into this autobody, autoantibody, antibody phenomena. And they, I saw that there are so already some medications being developed in that direction so that within maybe a few months, we will have a whole toolbox of different treatment, diagnostics and whatever methods at disposition that uh, physicians can try and that will be of the benefit of the long haulers. We, we don't have to, we don't have much time to lose. And one more last word to Shankara is like, uh, shall we start to communicate that, that a little bit widely? Because it's very concerning if people on the third day of symptom development in COVID infection all of a sudden have such a severe uh, cardiac uh, problems. I mean, that is really a wake-up call. Thank you very much, George. Uh, Valentina? Hello. So first of all, thank you very much for everyone who joined us today as speakers and panelists. Three hours of your time, but I hope it brought quite significant changes in your minds on where we are now and what we need to do in the future we can't work alone that's uh, that's a full stop we need joint effort and uh, as a coalition we will look for more researchers more experts in this field to help us drive research and then treatments as a foundation i i would really love to say that don't lose the hope 
there are solutions. We discussed these solutions. Even your healthcare systems failed for two years to provide adequate treatment and support. Don't think you are anxious or depressed or you need antidepressants to treat long COVID. That is not the right path for everyone. We develop treatments, we find relevant research and we communicate that through our channels. So just stick to us. There is a hope and you will be one day on the right path to recovery. Thank you very much for your involvement. And uh, we look forward to our fourth Congress in the nearest future. So stick with us. Thank you. Thank well said, Valentina. Uh, Andrea? It was a tremendously interesting conference, tremendously important for everybody. And I hope tremendously important for patients as well who are listening to us now. Uh, and as a systems biologist, I'm looking at every question from a variety of perspectives. And now I see that one of the most important perspectives, in addition to scientific and medical one, is the perspective of public health. We really have such a large number of post-COVID cases that we have to deal with them. I just recently checked uh, the clinical trial.gov system for uh, clinical trials. And there are a lot of various kinds of clinical trials, including for nutraceuticals, for actual COVID, for acute phase of COVID. But there are very little treatments which are right now being officially tested for long COVID. Very little. I counted 10 different approaches. And majority of those approaches are replicas from some other drugs. It's retargeting for one specific aspect of the long COVID but not for long COVID as such. I think that we need to somehow as a society make sure that regulatory organs and organs which are supporting the research are really on the same page and they are really adequately providing resources for the tasks which we are having right now. It is extremely important that patients will be treated now. In rare diseases, that's another area which I'm working with. In rare diseases, there is a saying that there is a seven years on average so-called patient journey, right? That is a journey from the time when the patient got sick and when patient actually get diagnosis and possibly treatment which is fitting to this diagnosis. But rare diseases typically affect each disease, just a small group of people. Even if rare disease is a large group, is a very important group. Post-COVID, long COVID is not a rare disease. It is right now a prevailing force which we are having in our society which shaping up the health of human populations and shaping up not in a very good way. So we really need to urgently combine resources and retarget resources in order to work on the treatments rather than on observations. The science right now contributing a lot to observation of various cohorts of long COVID patients, but not to the treatment. And we really need to retarget ourselves. And I think in this, in this uh, way, it is very, very important that we had this conference and we looked at the work of physicians which are trying to approach the problem from various directions all of them in this particular conference going toward anti-coagulation and uh, everything which is uh, connected to the blood system but we touched a little bit on autoimmunity we touched uh, on immune overactivation on the having reservoirs of the virus in various tissues etc so I think there is a time right now to combine all this knowledge, not just for the sake of knowledge, but for the sake of helping every patient. I think that uh, we are getting there. Thank you very much, Ansha. And I, I'd say thank you to everyone, especially to Valentina and Joachim for pulling all these people together. And they've done a lot of work in the background, finding all these experts, interacting with them, pulling them together. I get the privilege of hosting them on the platform, but hearing the cutting edge, and I am telling you, 
that this is the most cutting edge breakthrough thinking that you will come across. These experts are some of the best in the world and we will continue to try and find them. So thank you again for the coalition for pulling this together and thank you everyone. And um, you. I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Philip.